Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Lovely to see you all. Thank you all for coming. I will now open this meeting. Uh, the first thing we are going to do today is we're going to have a special general meeting, and then we will have the normal meeting after that. Uh, so the special general meeting has been called uh, by the council to revise the bylaws of the British Astronomical Association. You have had uh, the piece of paper which explains this with the uh, last copy of the journal, which was a booklet that looked like this, which explains these changes to the bylaws. Now, constitutionally, the bylaws have to be approved at a meeting of the members like this, which has been advertised to them. So we have done all that. So the principal effect of these proposals is A, to end the practice of members voting annually on the subscription rates for the next session at a special general meeting, which is the meeting that we've always held in March in the past. Uh, but instead, the decision on the subscription rates will be taken by the council in future. And B, uh, another principal effect is to give the Board of Trustees the explicit authority to replace the traditional postal ballot for the Board of Trustees and Council with an online ballot only if they decide that that is a cost-effective and a good idea because we are spending a lot of money on holding two ballots, a postal ballot and an online ballot, and the take-up for the online ballot, the take-up for the postal ballot has become very low these days. So we're not saying that we are going to do that, but this gives the Board of Trustees the authority to take that decision, should they so wish. And C uh, is to remove affiliated societies as a type of membership. So we will still have affiliated societies, we just will not uh, be charging them a membership fee, we will not be automatically sending them a journal and handbook, uh, but we still want to have affiliated societies. Uh, it would be just a, a, a kind of friendly arrangement. Uh, and there are other minor changes in there to uh, clarify some of our procedures. Uh, so I hope you've uh, been able to read uh, this, and I will take any questions on this text uh, from any of you if you want to ask. These have all been extensively debated by the council already, and the council has agreed to put this to you. But any points that you want to ask or put to the meeting, then I will hear from them now. OK. Uh, so another point that's been raised with me by several people is the uh, proposals for the subscription rate. Now, we came up with a package of changes to the subscription categories, not the rates, but the categories. And one of these change, these have all been mentioned in the journal, but one of these changes was to remove the honorary membership, the, remove the practice of giving new honorary memberships after 50 years. So in the past, when somebody's been a member continuously for 50 years, they become an honorary member, they no longer have to pay for their membership in the future. Now, those honorary memberships that exist will continue, but we are proposing not to create more honorary memberships after uh, 2016, after August of 2016. And uh, 2026, two year, basically two years' time. And this came out of a desire to, A, simplify our membership structure, reduce administration burden, uh, but also to change the balance of the way people pay for the association so that uh, people... Uh, so that older people are contributing more. We'll also be merging the uh, senior category with the ordinary category, category, so there will no longer be a drop in subscription once you pass the age of 65, I think. Is it 65? Yeah, once you pass the age. So, so there will not be that change. So it's a rebalancing of the payments so that the older generation are paying more. And that's been a deliberate policy by the the Board of Trustees. And um, I th uh, Tony, who is here, or is, where's Tony gone? Hirsch, Tony. 
Tony would like to uh, talk about the proposal to remove the honorary membership after 50 years. Uh, do you want to come up here? Yeah. Maybe speak to the microphone. <coughs> Tony is vice chair of Newbury Astronomical Society. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm very grateful to our, our president for allowing me to speak about honorary memberships and for us to hold an advisory vote. Um, in the BAA Journal of December last year, there was an article about our president informing members of changes to the membership structure that David's outlined that also said that a decision has been taken that no new honorary members will be created after August 2026. Now, honorary members are those people with 50 years continuous membership of the BAA, and members are currently rewarded with free subscription. Now, I think membership of anything for 50 years continuously is an amazing achievement. I mean, most marriages don't last that long. Um, and I thought um, maybe honorary memberships were being scrapped for financial reasons. There are 250 honorary members, and so their membership fee would have been £12,500 per year. But income to the BAA was £132,000 last year, and we have assets of one and a half million pounds. So I didn't think it could be for financial reasons. So in December 23, I asked a question on the BAA discussion forum to see if other members agreed with me that 50 years membership should still be recognized. And there have been 46 posts on that topic. And many people have commented that they would like the honorary membership category to continue. Several people mentioned that the title of honorary member doesn't have to come with free subscription, it's just being recognized that was appreciated and that receiving the title of honorary member and a mention in the journal and maybe a, a token gesture uh, like a gold tie pin or similar would be perfectly acceptable. And two quotes from the discussion forum really summed it up for me. So one person said, I'm only two years away from my 50 years membership, and I'm feeling deflated by the trustees. It's not the subscription money I will save if my membership becomes honorary, as the lost feeling of pride and <laughs> achievement on missing out on an honorary membership from the association I've been proud to have belonged to for most of my life. And a second person said, as someone well away from achieving honorary status, it's always impressed me to see the names added to that list each year. So to sum up, I think 50 years continuous membership of the BAA is an extraordinary achievement and should be recognized. Even if the BAA doesn't want to recognize the milestone with free subscription, which, as I said earlier, I think could easily be afforded, I still think we should keep the title of honorary members to people reaching 50 years continuous membership, mention them in our journal, and give them some token of a reward, like a certificate or, or a badge. So, we're going to have a, a, an advisory vote on the topic, and I would urge people here to, work, to vote with me on this subject and ask the trustees and council to reconsider their decision to scrap honorary membership. Okay, thank you very much, Terry. Uh, I'd like to ask Andrew Wilson Andrew Wilson uh, chaired the group, the working group on subscriptions. This was, this was first discussed by the strategy group of the BAA in um, about two years ago, and then we set up a series of working groups to consider other aspects of, consider the individual aspects of strategy. The whole subject of subscription categories 
we thought that was worth looking at in the uh, strategy group, and then a group to specifically look at that was set up, which was chaired by Andrew Wilson, who's also our systems manager, and um, also does a lot of work for the variable star section. Anyway, uh, Andrew has a good idea of the nuts and bolts of the administrative system that we use, and uh, the group that he chaired came up with this proposal uh, to simplify the subscription structure and re reduce the number of candidates. So could you give the meeting an, an idea of uh, what the considerations were there? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, yeah, I chaired the, um, the strategy group on subscriptions and donations, uh, which had five members of council on it. Um, what we were looking at was um, whether there are ways to simplify our subscription structure, which is quite complex, particularly behind the scenes. I think we have something like 26 categories when we actually get into the nuts and bolts. But also, not just look at simplification, but actually take a fresh look at all the categories and also look at um, how we distribute the income which we get in from subscriptions. And what the group wasn't looking at was what income we actually get from subscriptions. That's decided by the treasurer um, along with the trustees. So they then, they'll look each year at how much income we should be bringing in via subscriptions and then that can lead to what levels individual category types um, of subscription are set to or proposed. Um, we also look to make sure that any proposals which we we're going to make were feasible to be actually done, but also not increase the running costs of the BAA. Um, as a little bit of a background, we also kind of, from the data which we look at, we know that we're struggling to attract members below about the age of 60 or 65, with only about 15% of our members in that sort of age range. And what that also means is that there are very few people who pay the actual ordinary membership rate at the BAA. Most of the members pay a, redu a reduced rate. Um, and one of the things strategy, the strategy group considered was the fact that um, the ability to pay is on a, a variety of different circumstances. It can be whether you're retired, it can be age, but it can also be younger people with families and also anyone who's uh, on a lower income may have some difficulty paying the BA membership. So if we're sort of giving a lower, we, we do have a, a fund out there to help members who sort of need to who have some difficulty paying, but that's why we kind of looked at all the different categories, not just honorary, and how we do it. And with the idea of being how we might redistribute how we get the income which we do get from subscriptions across the membership. Um, our group included honorary members, and what it was viewed within the group was that having a free subscription when you reach 50 years um, wasn't necessarily something which was kind of necessary and kind of appropriate, but what might be more appropriate is perhaps something like a certificate to sort of recognise, because there is an achievement of 50 years membership which should be recognised, but just to look at how we might recognise it in a different way, so then we redistribute the burden of paying subscriptions more evenly across the membership. Um, I think that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank I, I you. Answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, would anybody else like to speak about this? Has anybody else got strong views on this? Uh, Nick James. I've got fairly strong views. Do you want I mean, to come and speak <laughs> then? <laughs> up here. Strong views. But, by the way, it's occurred to me that I haven't held a formal vote on the bylaws yet. I will come back to that later. I, I have strong views on lots of things, as anyone who knows me says. I think um, Tony's forum discussion was really useful and it was really good, but I was one of the people who I think is very strongly against honorary membership, mainly for the reasons, I think, of fairness. Um, you know, just because you happen to have 50 years continuous membership, and it's not 50 years of membership in total, it has to be 50 years continuous. So you need to have been lucky enough, like I am, and as Pauline pointed out when I got my award last time, I'm pretty old, and I'm actually one year away from honorary membership, um, and I would actually like to voluntarily not take it, even if it's still in place. I think it's, it's unfair. I'm, I've not got a problem with maybe giving somebody some gold typing or, or something, but I think in terms of actually giving people who are lucky enough to have had the circumstances to have been a member continuously for 50 years, a free subscription for the rest of their life, and where, in my case, that might be quite a while, I hope, 
um, I think is really unfair because what we're trying to do as, a, as an association is actually encourage younger people to join. And I think it's just unfair that they should be subsidising old crones like me. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. One other issue with the honorary membership, we find it creates an administrative burden because we have to check up regularly to check that these members are still alive. Because if people are sent the journal and they die, then generally it gets back to us that the journal is being sent to somebody who's deceased. But if, 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 if they're not paying anything, sometimes we're not told, and we, we cannot know whether our members are alive or dead. So it's, it's, it imposes an extra administrative job to um, try and contact these people periodically. But you may say that that's the thing we should be doing anyway. Uh, well, yes. Yes, sir. Right. yes, certainly. Don't talk in the microphone. I, I, so I've been a member of 61 years, and so I've been enjoying 11 years and hopefully a few more years of free membership. When I received my free membership, my honorary membership, I was a, it was a proud day. I was quite, in, I, I, you know, I was a bit of a crap. I didn't have any formal, apart from a, sh a letter from the, from the uh, secretary to say, you know, got that point. But it, it, I'm proud to say I'm an honorary member of the British Astronomical Association. But it does concern me we have 250 of us. <laughs> we are, we do, you know, we're not paying. So I've made the personal decision. I, I don't have a paper journal anymore. I have just electronic membership. And that, that will reduce our, I, I would suggest we, if we're going to carry on with the same situation of having free membership, then only give people electronic membership. Because if they decease and don't tell us, it's not costing us any money. So uh, that's just my view. But I, I think, and looking at the forum that um, Tony referred to, people are quite passionate about the fact that this honorary position is, or post, post is a, a membership, is they're, they're proud of. And I think we have to consider that. I'm certainly proud of it. But um, I'm sorry I've cost you money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think we could still do something uh, to honour uh, members after 50 years continuous membership without giving them the free membership. Uh, I, Andrew. I was going to add one thing, which was, um, it is a great achievement, and it should be something which we honour. I think perhaps the thing which we're suggesting is that you don't create a membership category called honorary. Yeah. And that's the thing, because then you, you have to, you need to remove those in, people into that membership category of honorary, which will still have the existing honorary members. Um, but instead, you know, we can have a, a certificate, we might choose to call people honorary, even though their membership would still be ordinary or digital or something <coughs> along those lines, but we, we just wouldn't have the honorary membership as new people moving into an honorary membership as a membership category. Yeah. Right, thank you, Andrew. Anybody else want to say anything about this? Uh, what I propose to do now is, is take an indicative vote, uh, just a show of hands about uh, who supports the general uh, approach of the board on this or who thinks the board should look again at this subject of honorary members. Uh, this will just be an advisory vote, but this won't create a bylaw, it won't bind the council to do anything, just an indication of the level of feeling on this. Uh, so. Sorry, Who, David. Yes. Can I, can I clarify? But so we've we've really got three <coughs> positions, haven't we? We've got scrap the honorary membership. We've got keep the honorary membership, but don't pay for it. Yeah. yeah, keep charging them, or we've got keep it as it is at the moment. So I just want to clarify what mm. we're voting for. I, I, my interpretation of honorary membership is it is the free membership. That's what we're talking about. So you've got 
a yes for the free membership and a no for the other two. Yeah, so I'd like to ask who is in favour of uh, the approach of carrying on as we have been doing and giving the free membership automatically to those who have been continuously members for 50 years. <coughs> so who is in, in favour of carrying on as we have been doing? <laughs> two. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight. 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 I reckon eight hands up. And who thinks that we should end the free membership after 50 years? <laughs> I'll count again. One, two. I'll count again. <laughs> Four, five, six, seven. I made it thirty. Yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> uh, and any abstentions? Well, you also have to ask who wants to keep the category but, but change it. Yeah, we should vote on that. Not keeping the category, but send something. Yeah. yeah. We've, got a, we've got a award honorary membership yeah. of 50 years. I think. Yeah, good one. Uh, I think that just seems to be. Right. So, but not with free membership, but with a tie pin or a certificate. So people get out, did it? So I sense, we that, I sense there is a desire to make a gesture towards those who've achieved yeah. Yeah. honorary membership. Yeah. Uh, doing something public, um, they could be mentioned in the journal, they could have a certificate sent to them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think, I've, I won't take any more votes. I, th I think we're agreed on that. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. That's, so that's very useful to find out your opinion on that. <laughs> I will now return to the bylaws as published here. Changes the bylaws. Nobody has proposed any amendments to that. <coughs> uh, so, can I have your votes in favour of these proposals to amend the bylaws? All those in favour? Difficult. <laughs> All votes against? Oh, that's easier. <laughs> <laughs> Any abstentions? <laughs> one abstention. That's definitely one. <laughs> so I, I, I declare the proposed alterations to the bylaws of the BAA carried. Thank you very much. Uh, I now declare that's an end to the special general meeting, and we will now commence with the uh, second. Uh, Members' meeting of 20, uh, oh, well, second of this session, first of 2024. I'd like to uh, ask if there's any new members here who've never been to a meeting before. I would um, very much like to welcome you. Right, so <laughs> yes. let's come up again, uh, <laughs> Tony, and I will welcome you to the association. <laughs>
um, I now, uh, as is traditional, ask the paper secretary, Jeremy Shears, to tell the meeting what papers have been approved by council for publication in the journal. Thank you, David. At the meeting this morning, Council accepted two papers for publication in the journal. Uh, the first is Deep Sky Section Variable Nebulae Report for 2020 to 2023 by Grant Privet and Richard Sargent. And the second one is Martian Canals in Poetry and Prose by <coughs> Nick Long. Thank you, Jeremy. I'll now give you the notices of um, forthcoming meetings. Uh, we, we have a, a reciprocal arrangement with the Society for Popular Astronomy that Hooray. BAA members are allowed to go to their meetings and they're allowed to come here, as, as uh, a couple of them seem to have done. And they're looking suitably popular. <laughs> So um, they've got to their AGM on 27th of January, Saturday at 1400 in the Gustav Tuck Lecture Theatre of University College. So BA members, welcome to go to that. Uh, then I'll mention that Astrofest, the big um, exhibition at Kensington Town Hall run by Astronomy Now, that's occurring again. That's uh, Friday and Saturday, 2nd to 3rd of February, and the BAA will have a stand there. We'll be selling our wares and trying to recruit new members. So if you go to Astrofest, and the talk's always like, excellent there, if you go there, say hello to the BAA uh, team of volunteers there on 2nd or 3rd of February. Uh, on Saturday, the 10th of February, they... I'm not sure about this, actually, because the website isn't clear. So <coughs> there may be an exoplanet online meeting that day. Does anybody know? Um, it's, they're not certain if it's going to happen on that date because of availability of speakers. Okay, well, ignore that then. may or may not happen. <laughs> yeah. Definitely on the 16th of March, there is the annual meeting of the Deep Sky section. This is uh, all day at the Humphrey Rooms in Northampton, and that promises to be an excellent day, and there'll be refreshments served <coughs> and uh, excellent speakers. Uh, so uh, that's been organized by Callum Potter and his team in the Deep Sky section. It's always a popular event, so book up for that on the website. That's sec Saturday the 16th of March, <coughs> and the next meeting <coughs> here will be 27th of March, uh, Wednesday at 1700. Uh, that's the, our next uh, London meeting here at the IOP. Now, I have a pleasurable duty to perform. I'm going to give a medal to Janice McLean. There's a lot to say about Janice. <laughs> there you go. This, this medal is called the Lydia Brown Medal. And it's awarded for meritorious service to the association in an honorary capacity over many years. Uh, Janice was nominated for this by Anne Davies, Philip Jennings, Jeremy Shears, and Lynn Smith. Now, Janice has done many things for the association. Uh, she's edited the comment section newsletter since 2015. Uh, she also joined the council in 2015 and got very involved Straight away, uh, she became the founding editor of our email newsletter, which has now, uh, she's been producing it since 2018, and it's now run to over 70 editions. In addition, since 2017, she's been our events coordinator, and in that capacity, she's been promoting the BAA at external events, also all organizing our advertising in uh, external press, uh, she's been organising and she's been present at uh, the when we have been at the New Scientist Live shows for the last five years, apart from the lockdown. Also, the Practical Astronomy shows, uh, at, which are the, is a, another event which occurs in the Midlands, and the Federation of Astronomical Society annual conventions. All these events, annual events, the BAA attends, and she's been organising that, and she's been present most of the time at those events, and some of them are really an awful lot of work, very gruelling, particularly the New Scientist Live, which takes place over three or four days, and thousands of people go. Uh, 
So she's done all that. She also regularly rep writes reports for the journal and for the website about these events. And she's also taken a lot of interest in uh, women astronomers, women in the BAA, their contribution, uh, highlighting their contributions. She's written articles for the journal about that. She's given talks about that. She's been on the board of trustees for six years. Uh, her professional experience is uh, to do with the, the police and the law. She's taken part in um, <coughs> administering, she's taken leading part in administering a couple of legal cases that the BAA is involved with and that, that is work that's still ongoing. Uh, she's been described by her nominators for this award as an action-oriented action individual. <laughs> <laughs> so she's an excellent winner, the Lydia Brown uh, uh, medal. So come and receive your award. is mainly what I can say. Um, particularly thank you to Anne, uh, Anne Davies, uh, Philip Jennings, Jeremy Shears, and to Lynn Smith watching up in Scotland somewhere. Um, I am very touched. I, I was, I think, bullied with a, a, a beer into getting involved on the council. <laughs> which seems to be a normal BAA tactic. <laughs> Never go for a drink after a BAA meeting. You get jobs to do. Um, and, uh, but it, it's been a lot of fun. I, I enjoy doing it. And when I see a job that I think, yeah, we, we should be doing that, I always... I'm learning now to hold my breath before <laughs> saying, why aren't we doing such and such? <laughs> because you end up doing it. But it's been a real privilege to be awarded this. There's uh, many illustrious members who have achieved it, maybe one or two not so illustrious spring <laughs> to mind, but generally <laughs> illustrious. And I think it, it, it's important to recognise that it's not just about the pure astronomical work that is done, the you know, the observing and the imaging and so on. There's a lot of admin goes on behind it to make it happen to make our presence there at outside and outreach events. So all I can say is thank you very much to the BAA. Thank you to our president, Mr. David Arditi, uh, for uh, giving me this nomination, or giving me this award today, and to all the lovely friends and colleagues out there. Thank you. So we'll uh, move on to the first talk of the day. Our first speaker is Mike Frost. <laughs> Mike Frost is uh, well known to many of you. He's director of the BAE's historical section. He's also meeting secretary for the Society for the History of Astronomy. He's an engineer by profession, specializes in steel mills, and making them work. Uh, and uh, that's work that takes him all over the world, uh, particularly to Australia, which he really enjoys visiting. He often travels around the world to see eclipses, aurorae, and meteor showers, and sites of astronomical and historical interest. And today, he will, his talk is entitled Eclipse and Revelation. You need to do something to get this on the screen. Now that should be plugged in there. Yeah. 
Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, David. Uh, I would like to tell you today about a seven-year project um, that uh, I've been involved with personally. I've been involved with for the last three years as a contributor and for the last year in the production and the editing of Eclipse and Revelation. And the main deliverable from this project is a book which is coming out, which is not, why is that not working? Why is nothing happening? Okay, a uh, book coming out, uh, I hope, February the 6th in the UK, a little bit later on in the United States. Uh, Eclipse and Revelation, Total Solar Eclipses in Science, History, Literature, and the Arts. And if you look inside the book, which I've not yet been able to do because I've only seen it in PDF, it says, two questions guide this seven-year project. First, how can we approach the phenomenon representation interpretation of total solar eclipses? And second, how can we heal the historical divide separating the natural sciences from the humanities, arts, history, and theology. So, modest, modest project. <laughs> and I, you see, uh, if you look at the, the cover, uh, that despite my claim to have been involved with the editing, my name does not appear on the cover. Uh, so I should start by introducing you to the two people whose names do appear on the cover. Uh, an old friend of mine and a new friend. Uh, the old friend is Tom McLeish, who was the uh, Professor of Natural Philosophy at York University in the United Kingdom. Uh, and my new friend is uh, 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 Henry Kalanga, who is the Associate Professor of, oh, I think I'm trying to get this right, uh, uh, Italian Renaissance Art and Architecture at the University of California's Berkeley campus in the Bay Area, San Francisco. Um, and uh, I'd say, uh, Henry is a new friend of mine, but Tom and I go back a very long way. In fact, some of you may, some of you honorary members may remember Tom from, uh, from way back when. He was a member of the British Astronomical Association in his teenage years, and he attended uh, several Win Winchester weekends, for example. So you may, may know him from a very long time ago. He was a member, he was at Seven Oaks School, and he was part of uh, Henry Hatfield's group, Commander Henry Hatfield, who had a, a assembled a group of uh, excellent uh, uh, school kids who did really excellent observing. And I'm looking at one of them right now, another president of the, of the uh, uh, of the BAA, Jeremy Shears was uh, was part of that group, and Tom and Jeremy met for the first remet for the first time in 40 years at the uh, BAA historical section meeting in York in 2014. I came on the scene slightly later. Tom and I were both undergraduate mathematicians at Emmanuel College in Cambridge. Uh, that's Tom there. We arranged for him to be custard pie. Jer jolly, jolly student Japes with the, the college porter looking on. Uh, uh, Tom went on to, uh, first of all, to become a natural scientist and then on into a career in physics and I went my own direction into uh, astronomy and then into engineering. Uh, but we had a lot in common. Uh, we were both runners, latterly both scuba divers, both astronomers, and we had an interest in general in science. So we're both involved in the incarnation in the 1980s of the, of the college's science society, the Thomas Young Club. Thomas Young was uh, one of the more eminent members of Emmanuel. He was, a, uh, he was the guy who came up with the wave theory of light, uh, Young's modulus uh, from, uh, from your physics days, uh, and also the, the trans, part of the translation of the Rosetta Stone. He was, according to his biographer, the last man who knew everything. Uh, so it, it, we're living up to quite a lot. And you can see, uh, this gives some idea of Tom's sort of range of interests uh, that uh, we held a talk on, God and the scientist. Uh, the puns on there are mostly mine, I think, but uh, Tom, Tom did the intellectual stuff, and I came up with the bad jokes. Uh, he went on to a career in physics, as I say, and his, uh, his particular interest, uh, he, he went around the, uh, the northern universities, Leeds and Durham and York, uh, his particular interest was soft matter, the kind of long, straggly polymers that you find at the bottom of ponds. Uh, so the Times nicknamed him Professor Slime. Uh, th this went on his Christmas card, of course. Uh, but he uh, wrote a number of books, you can see across a very wide range, uh, Faith and Wisdom in Science, 
uh, uh, not particularly my area, but very densely argued, lots, lots and lots of ideas fizzing out of it. Uh, I preferred actually poetry and music of science, the idea of comparing creativity and science and art. How is it that artists are regarded as creative and scientists aren't, when there's an immense amount of creativity goes into science? At this particular book, I'm not, uh, I'm not the only fan of this particular book, uh, Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, uh, cited it once. He said, uh, le penseur anglais, Tom McLeish. That went on his Christmas card as well. <laughs> and then you'll see, uh, he also uh, appeared on the BBC's Thought for the Day, uh, to, uh, just before 8 o'clock in the morning on, uh, on Radio 4's Today show. Uh, always, uh, obviously it's a, it's a religious section of the programme, but always with a scientific bias some scientific uh, uh, content to his, his particular talks. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, what we had in, uh, in 2014, he was part of something called the Ordered Universe Project, uh, which is re-evaluating medieval science. And he gave us a splendid talk, one of the best we've ever had for the section, on the science of uh, uh, Robert Grosstester, Bob Bighead, the, uh, the Bishop of Lincoln during the 13th century, whose ideas on science were startlingly modern. I already knew about Grosstester for his work on the rainbow, and indeed the Audion Universe Project took that work and produced a, a, a refereed scientific paper in the, in the science journals about the medieval ways of classifying colours. Uh, but uh, the, the talk he gave us was about the medieval cosmology, the medieval version of the Big Bang. Quite astonishing uh, that uh, they, they didn't have the data to back up uh, their observations, but their science was first rate. The, idea, the intellectual work that they were doing in the 13th century, what we'd regard as the Dark Ages, was quite astonishing. And we have lessons to learn from it today. So Tom, as you can see, had a very wide range of ideas. And in August 2017, he went to an interdisciplinary conference in the Notre Dame Institute of Advanced Science, which is in the top right-hand corner of Indiana in the United States. This wasn't a coincidence. Uh, August the 21st, 2017, of course, was the first great American eclipse that made its way right across the United States. Tom actually contacted me beforehand to ask if I'd like to join his group who were intending going to see the eclipse. Uh, and I'd already looked at the weather and figured out that it was better to be in the western United States. And indeed, I saw this particular eclipse from the Oregon-Idaho border. Absolutely beautiful uh, shadow bands going down the austere hills of the, of the Snake River Valley in Oregon. Um, Tom and his friends sneaked out of the conference. Uh, they picked a day when none was speaking. Uh, they, they looked at the weather themselves, figured out that uh, Illinois, their original destination, was going to be too cloudy, went south to Crofton in Kentucky. Uh, and I don't show it here, but they did actually see totality. And that was the first time uh, that uh, Tom had seen a total eclipse. But on the way back and in the subsequent part of the conference, the conference were looking for a subject on which to have a multidisciplinary uh, approach. And, and uh, as a result of it, the idea to everybody look at total solar eclipses from as many academic disciplines as possible. So a number of people who were at the conference ended up contributing to the book, including the other editor, uh, Henrika Lange, is, from, uh, uh, is originally from Hamburg in Germany, and as I say, she's a professor of uh, Renaissance art and architecture. Uh, this is one of the books she's written, uh, Giotto's Arena Chapel, which I believe is in Padua in Italy, a quite splendid bu building which she has analysed in, in gorgeous detail, extraordinary, extraordinary artwork there. Makes me want to go and visit it sometime. So an art historian brings completely different viewpoint to something like total <coughs> eclipses. We're looking at the representation of it, in various forms. Uh, to begin with, it, it was telling you what was going on, and it is not good news. Uh, this is the last, uh, mainland Britain's last but four total, uh, last but three total eclipses. 1999, I was clouded out. 1927, most people in the north of England were clouded out. 1724, it was not good on Harrodon Hill. Uh, this was by uh, William Stukeley, I think, is, is the guy who did the, um, um, uh, the biography of Isaac Newton. So he knew his science, but it's, uh, his weather forecasting was not great. It was, it was not a good time. Uh, looking forward to the Victorian era, perhaps, we're moving into the new technology. So Annie Maunder, who I hope is well known to this audience, one of our finest ever members of the association, a superb solar photographer, pretty good editor of the journal as well, of course. But uh, she, she took this beautiful photograph 
1898 with these amazing coronal streamers. She'd photographed the sun every day from Greenwich as part of her job, so she knew what she was doing. These were the best coronal pictures taken to this point here. And then on the left, you see this sort of representational thing from uh, Mabel, Todd, Lo Ma Mabel Loomis Todd uh, writing about an upcoming eclipse in the United States. There is so much wrong with that picture. <laughs> the moon is far too close to the Earth. The sun is far too close to the Earth. What's that grot behind the Earth? I'm not quite entirely sure. But in other ways, it's telling people what's going on. It's a sort of God's eye view of what's happening in the total eclipse. So even though... It doesn't bear any resemblance to what's actually happening. It conveys some idea that the moon moves in front of the sun, that shadow reaches down, just about touches the earth, and if you're in the right place, in that narrow track of totality, you get to see a total eclipse. So it does, it conveys what it has to, whilst taking liberties with what it doesn't need to be, uh, need to be precise about. I, I, I'm quite impressed with the thinking going on behind that. Somebody else who was very much involved in the project from the beginning is a chap called David Bentley Hart from the Notre Dame Institute. Uh, David is a uh, philosopher, theologian, historian, and baseball fan who has written many, many books in which he mixes those things up in, 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 in uh, varying quantities. Uh, for us, he didn't, he, uh, there wasn't too much about baseball in his chapter, but there was a, a very well-written piece of prose about going to see an eclipse for the first time. Uh, I really, this is my favourite bit, I realised something rather curious. While my own experience of the stars became invisible during the eclipse, had in most obvious respects matched the description of various ancient medieval or early modern chroniclers, also differed in one very conspicuous way. Whereas all of them had remarked on it, and some had noted the wonder and terror the sight of it had evoked, absolutely none of them had said anything at all regarding to me what seemed the most immediately obvious thing about the solar eclipse, to wit, its ravishing beauty. How true. How amazingly true. They, they, you know, it, it, perhaps it takes somebody seeing one for the first time to point out the leading obvious. Eclipses of the sun are absolutely beautiful. There's many other things you can say about them, but that's the main, main thing that you should bear in mind. And then we had a musicologist. Uh, Elaine Stratton Hilt from uh, University of Würzburg in Germany. If I was to say to you, total eclipse in music, I'm going to guess about half of you are going to say, Bonnie Tyler. <laughs> most, most of the rest uh, may well say Pink Floyd. Uh, but yes, indeed, we've got some Pink Floyd fans in today. Uh, but how about Charlie Mingus, 1960, wrote a song, Eclipse, about interracial relationships. The blinding white of the sun meets the dark of the moon. He wasn't allowed to sing about interracial relationships, but he did so anyway through the metaphor of an eclipse. Or um, uh, Handel, a total eclipse uh, from Samson. In this case, it's a metaphor for the sudden loss of strength of Handel had his hair chopped off and suddenly he is strong no more. John Taverner, a total eclipse. In this case, it's religious faith, the Damascene conversion of Paul on his way to the, uh, on, the, on the road to Damascus. And then how about um, a young boy never broke again? Uh, Kentrell Deshaun Golden. Me neither. But his talk, <laughs> his, his song, Solar Eclipse, has 140 million views on YouTube. So uh, clearly he's the, we are not the audience he's aiming at. But it, uh, his song, it's, it's valid. He uses a solar eclipse for the metaphor for the many things, the, uh, the many big changes that have gone on in his life. Even, even rap musicians can use solar eclipses as, as a valid metaphor for the things that are going on. And then there's Wayne Grimm. Uh, Wayne Grimm works at the Exploratorium in San Francisco, uh, and he writes kind of experimental music, uh, and he wrote a piece of music to be driven by a total eclipse. He takes the feed from uh, the, uh, one of the NASA cameras looking at the 2017 eclipse, feeds it into an algorithm, this is the algorithm from his website. Again, me neither. Uh, those appear to be Penrose tilings down there, um, um, non-repeating uh, 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 non tilings of the plane and uh, all sorts of other things going on. And then what comes out of it is a series of his instructions to be given to uh, the people playing it, uh, which in 2017 was the Kronos Quartet, that uh, great American string quartet who are up for anything, essentially. And they did play during the eclipse. It wasn't a total eclipse in, in San Francisco, uh, but they I think they took the feed from the total eclipse and then uh, and, and, and used that to tell them what to play during the, the course of the eclipse. Uh, so on his website, uh, there's an example of what might happen. 
Um, and so let's have a listen. This is, the kind of, this is not what was played, but it, what could have been played, depending on what it sounded like. You'll notice that looks more like a transit of Venus to me, but there we go. It's all a feed from the, uh, from the sun, filtered in some manner or other, and given to a string quartet to play. There's going to be another performance on the 8th of April 2024 when the next Great American Eclipse happens across there. So uh, watch out for it. And one final member of the one final member of the of the original team, uh, and again involved in the Ordered Universe project, the, the medieval science, Giles Gasper from the, from Durham University, writing about eclipses in the Middle Ages, uh, and his is a theme that I see quite often: is this sort of um, uh, the mix between people who understand eclipses uh, and people who don't. Uh, this particular is an eclipse of the sun near total uh, over Britain in 1133, observed by King Henry I from Dover. Uh, and he talks, uh, this is one of the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, accounts of it by John of Worcester. Worcester it was pretty much total, uh, close to total in, in Dover, not so much in Worcester. And you get this idea that uh, I'm not sure John of Worcester really understands what's going on, because a lot of it is good. Uh, some places the day only appeared darkened, in others it's so dark men did need the guidance of candlelight. King and his followers walked about marvelling greatly, raised their heads and saw the sun shining as though it were the new moon. Mm, okay. Uh, one moment is broader, the next it was narrow, now curved, now straight, and seemed quivering and liquid like quicksilver. If you're right on the edge of totality, you get Bailey's beads that kind of roll right round the edge of the sun. Which you might, if you don't know anything else, described as being like quicksilver, maybe. Some claim that an eclipse of the sun had taken place. If this was the case, the sun was in the head of Draco uh, and the moon in the fifth sign, Leo. So clearly he doesn't understand what an eclipse is because he thinks that sun's over there and the moon's over there. He thinks he, he, he's this, he, what he's applying is for a lunar eclipse. So uh, uh, some, of, some of what he's saying is, seems to be accurate. Other of bits, uh, the moon was 27 days old. There's a clue there. Uh, and at the same time of the day and hour, many stars appeared. For a partial eclipse? Probably not. But actually, if we put it into Stellarium and looked at the, the flux levels and so on from Dover, and Venus was around, so we'd probably have seen that and might have thought it was a star. Mercury and Mars were around. <coughs> Arcturus, probably not visible when, the, when you've still got the, some of the sun covered. But you would have seen things that might have appeared to them like stars. So it's this mixture of uh, quite good uh, re reporting of what went on uh, plus uh, getting it completely wrong, plus some very interesting, very interesting observations. So we had a number of people already from historians, art historians, and so on. Uh, uh, Tom asked me, wanted me to come on board as a sort of eclipse nerd. Uh, I can't think of why he thought of me, but there we go. Uh, and he asked for more recommendations. And a couple of names I really wanted to get on board, one of whom we didn't, which was Kate Russo, the, uh, the, the Australian psychologist who writes about the psychology of people like me. And the other was... Uh, was, uh, was <laughs> Fortunately, she didn't contribute. The other was Jay Pasakoff. Uh, I'm hoping many of you will know uh, of Jay. Uh, probably a, 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 well, a, one of the foremost uh, a, a eclipse physicists, solar eclipse physicists, and a historian of astronomy, uh, and probably the person who has seen more eclipses than anybody else in history, though he's very modest about it, never wanted to point that out. There are others who uh, got near or, or uh, equal to his 37 total eclipses, 37, uh, but uh, the totaling, when you include annulars and, par and partials and so on, Jay was way ahead of the rest because he took his team from Williams College in Massachusetts to every single eclipse to do solar physics on it. Uh, and uh, you say the pictures he takes, but uh, Jay wrote a brilliant chapter about the history of the solar corona, uh, the way it sort of moved, the way we viewed eclipses, particularly in the 19th century. Beginning of the century, it was where are they going to happen? Uh, positional astronomy is trying to figure out where was going to see a total eclipse and where was going to see a partial eclipse so that you get yourself to the right place. Through the 1820s and 1830s, we started figuring out what was going on during an eclipse. Uh, that's when you start getting these first descriptions of prominences, Bailey's beads, it's uh, Francis Bailey from, I think, 1836, and more and more detail uh, concentrating on the beautiful pearly white solar corona. And then later on in the century, it's why? What's happening? What's causing all these things? And they had the new tools, uh, photography, and in particular, spectroscopy. Uh, 
In the eclipse of 1868, uh, they spotted some lines they had in the, in the, uh, in the corona and the prominences that they'd not seen before, in particular on the laboratory on Earth. Jules Janssen, uh, who was in India to make the eclipse, and Norman Pogson, we've discovered recently from, uh, from the Madras Observatory, managed to uh, describe the D3 line, which looked like it might be sodium, but wasn't. Norman Lockyer, one of my dead astronomers, observed the same thing a few weeks later, not during eclipse. He did the rather more technical, difficult bit of, uh, of just concentrating on the, on the corona. Uh, and he suggested that this was due to a new element. He called it after the sun, Helios. He called it helium. The helium was discovered during a total eclipse by looking at the corona. That enthused people. It was another 25 years before we found it terrestrially. But in the meanwhile, they'd found more lines in the solar corona that we hadn't spotted on Earth. In particular, coronium, which was long, were recognized for quite a few years as a new element. Unfortunately, didn't fit in the periodic table. And by the end of the century, it was realized that this was due to very heavily ionized iron. 13 electrons, Fe14, 13 electrons knocked out of the iron atom. And the only way you can do that is if the corona is seriously hot, which it is. Thousands of degrees on the surface of the sun, a million or more degrees in the solar corona. And we still don't know exactly why this happens. I think we're getting towards answers of micro flares. I saw it in, on my way down reading a, uh, Sky at Night magazine, a theory about sort of serpentine uh, type prominences dumping out this energy into the, into the solar corona. I think we're beginning to figure it out but it was, an, it was something that originally came out of solar eclipse observations. Jay, also interested in culture and looking at eclipses and astronomy from many points of view, and he worked very closely with a lady called Roberta Olson, curator of drawings, New York Historical Society. Uh, an artist, but somebody with a very keen interest in science. She and, uh, she and Jay wrote a beautiful book called Cosmos, which perhaps some of you may have seen. Roberto was the lady who figured out that in the Giotto's adoration of the Magi, it's Halley's Comet up in the top left-hand corner. And that's the reason why the ESA probe to, uh, to, to the comet was named Giotto. It's on Roberta's suggestion in Scientific American. So again, uh, we're looking at uh, the, the art historian's view of solar eclipses is rather different. Um, this, is the, uh, this is one of my favorite ones from her chapter. This is a, an artist's view of a solar eclipse. Not the viewpoint, not the viewpoint I would have chosen, to be perfectly honest. Out it comes, uh, uh, for, and uh, 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 we're not seeing anything from here. But we are intrigued what they're all looking at. And why is that young lad in the middle there running? So people taller than him in front of him, can't he see? I don't know. We'll never know. Uh, but to you, this, again, these, these sort of different representations around eclipses. The chap on the right there is... Uh, it, it, it's representing that sort of um, Victorian thirst for knowledge that people are uh, uh, people are interested in what's going on. These amazing developments during the the, 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 uh, the, the Victorian era that uh, uh, somebody explaining a solar eclipse is worth having a portrait taken of him. That Brian Cox of his day explaining what's going on. <laughs> and then on the left hand side, this chap uh, with an eclipse uh, in the background. Uh, but look at his eye. It's got a had a, probably had a stroke or something like that. So there's probably more going on in that portrait than we th first understand. Perhaps the, the eclipse is a metaphor for something else. And then there were people who did actually draw or paint what they saw. J.W.M. Turner, of course, it was it was a great one for getting down the accurate representation of what was there in the sky. And if it was a cloudy day, Turner was going <laughs> to sketch it like it was, not not like it ought to be but like it was. Uh, my friend Mark Edwards also took, spoke to the historical section. He, he looks very closely at uh, Turner's, the, the astronomy in Turner's art. He, he's, he, he has arguments with the art historians as to which, eclipse it, which lunar eclipse or which solar eclipse is actually in the sketchbook. He thinks some of the catalogues have got it wrong. But it, it's, I, I love the dialogue between the art historians and the scientists. We can both inform each other. And how about literature? Well, Alison Cornish. Uh, is an expert. She's president of the North American Dante Society, so she should know about uh, uh, Dante Alighieri, the great poet. I don't. And my, my, level, my knowledge of Dante is at the sort of Dan Brown level. If you ever read it? Yeah, yeah. sorry. Sorry. Uh, but in the, in the Divine Comedy, uh, Dante, uh, Beatrice uh, talks to Dante of an extended metaphor about an eclipse uh, as in, in religious terms. 
uh, which uh, Alison understands, I'm not sure I do particularly, and certainly the illustrator doesn't, uh, because he's put a lunar eclipse in there. It's, uh, once again, it, uh, it, it, it's definitely a solar eclipse in, in, the, in the poem, but it's a lunar eclipse in the illustration. And that's not because Dante didn't know his astronomy. He certainly did. And Alison is, uh, has, read a book, uh, has written a book on reading Dante's stars about the astronomy in, in, uh, in Dante's works in which she quite freely cites the original work to talk about Dante, Dante and astronomy, Dante and the Early Astronomers by M. A. Orr. Uh, and if you've ever heard me talking about anything before too long, I get onto who M. A. Orr was. Mary Ackworth Orr was, sorry, Mary uh, married John Evershed from the, Victor, the Kodak and Al Observatory, so I know M. A. Orr better as Mary Evershed, my predecessor as the first director of the historical section. Uh, and I'd say uh, uh, her main historical researches were on the astronomy in Dante's poems. So we're going right across literature and art and music and so on. Uh, but of course, quite apart from the physics of the solar corona, there's other science to be done. Animal behavior, for example. Uh, Steve Portugal from Royal Holloway, this, uh, Steve on the, uh, on the left there, uh, gave us a chapter on animal behavior. Uh, that's not him on the top right. That's, uh, uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of species at uh, the Belgrade Zoo in 1999, enjoying the eclipse. Uh, and uh, Steve tells us all about the, uh, the, the solar and the lunar triggers for animal behavior that are disturbed by the presence of an eclipse when either the moon or the sun gets disturbed by, by the shadows of the, to either the Earth or the... Uh, you know what I mean? Eclipses, eclipses can definitely disturb animal behavior, certainly for birds. And that's a beautiful picture the, uh, by Leonardo Caldas in 2019 from Chile. He was taking video of that beautiful eclipse over the Andes uh, when uh, a flock of birds threw, flew through his, his view, of, uh, view of the eclipse, and that made astronomy photograph of the day. I can't quite match that uh, for, for beauty of astronomy. As anybody who knows my astronomical photography, I, I just don't. But uh, the last eclipse of the sun that we had in, in uh, last year in, uh, in uh, Exmouth in uh, Western Australia, I set up my iPhone to record the eclipse. Uh, and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let you play a game of guess the species. Uh, because uh, we had a 54 second total eclipse. Uh, and for most of that period, the, the um, galas, the skittish, stupid cockatoos around that part of the world decided it was time to roost and flew over us very, very noisily. So you've got to figure out Who's making which noise? Okay, 54 seconds of totality. Those are the humans, I'll give you that one. What about that one? I'm in the journal that not one of the little buggers flew from my field of view, but uh, actually there are a couple of them going through the bottom corner, so I retract that flame. 54 seconds of totality. You can see uh, uh, it's Jupiter up at the top, isn't it? So you can see how the skies differ across there. And then at the end of it, any second now, we're going to get to the end of our 54 seconds. And the humans get excited again. And, and the galas think, oh, oh, dawn again, right, better, get, <laughs> better start acting stupid again. So, uh, yeah, a beautiful, beautiful, absolutely beautiful eclipse. Uh, the fine detail of the, the, the provenances and so on was, was really rather gorgeous from, uh, from Australia. Uh, but my overriding memory was that stupid galas coming overhead. You can look at the weather as well. And that's of some interest to us when we go seeing eclipses of the sun, that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the weather... <coughs> Uh, it, it, the, the flux of the sun, of course, is going to be de depleted by the fact that the moon is moving in front of the sun. Uh, this is from uh, 19, uh, 2015, I'm sorry, uh, the, 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 the eclipse of the sun that went over the North Atlantic, missing almost all the land by the, uh, by the Faroe Islands and, and the Svalbard archipelago. Uh, and you can see the predictions of what's going to happen on the, uh, the left-hand side at uh, Reykjavik, uh, where the sun was pretty much 98% uh, obscured at Lerwick, where it was 97% um, 90, obscured, uh, and in Reading, uh, which is there for control purposes, because it was actually about 87% obscured there. And you can see the flux is definitely going down during the eclipse. And then on the right-hand side, what actually happened? 
uh, and it matches the predictions pretty well in uh, Reading and in Lerwick. Not so good in Reykjavik, which suggests to me that it was a really rather cloudy day in Reykjavik that day. Uh, the, the Faroe Islands also got quite a lot of cloud. Some people saw it, some people didn't, but uh, Nick and, uh, and others will know we had an absolutely perfect day in Svalbard. Couldn't, couldn't have been better. Could have been a bit warmer. But <laughs> we, we also saw it in the North Sea after yeah, a terrifying yeah, force well, <laughs> which also was not predicted by the Met Office. Uh, yeah, so the Met Office don't come out of it that well from, from this. Uh, the flux can drive various things, of course. It can drive, uh, it, it can drive the temperature. Clearly, uh, and the temperature is going to, uh, the further you away get from the totality zone, the less effect that has. In Svalbard, it dropped from a balmy minus 13 down to minus 22 and a half. Uh, I got frost nip in my fingers. Uh, and, uh, and that temperature difference can drive wind. So these are from 1999, where, of course, the, the, the track of totality went across Cornwall and Devon, the Channel Islands, and then on into France. And that, uh, that appears here and these, these, uh, the, to, to have driven winds away from the totality track. It, it's my experience, I think, that quite often you get a sort of calming of the wind during the totality period. Not always, but uh, that's my recollection from quite a few recent uh, eclipses. Uh, and of course, this has real world consequences. Uh, the, the particular is we're going greener and greener, uh, that, uh, that, that uh, certainly it's going to have an effect on the solar on the right. How can it not? Uh, that uh, if you're driving your stuff off a solar panel, then when the, the, the sun's covered by the moon, that flux is going to go down. Uh, but on the left-hand side, uh, it also has effects on the wind. Uh, it, it, it not, not as immediately obvious, but it's something you have to, to calculate. And it's kind of like the cup final effect, isn't it? Half time in the cup final, you've got to switch on to Norwig so that everybody can make a cup of tea. Similarly with the eclipse, that uh, you've got to worry about the effects. So it, it, eclipse forecasting does have, it does have real world effects. Back to the historians. I like history, yeah, historical section. Uh, it, it last but three was 1724 for British eclipses. Last but four, 1715 was quite a clear day. And then before that, Scotland's, last, mainland Scotland's uh, last, uh, last total eclipse it, in Merck Monday, Black Monday in 1652. Uh, and some interesting things happened at that time. We were in the middle of a civil war. We just chopped off King Charles's head. Heaven forbid. Uh, and uh, everybody tried to co-opt. Everybody tried to co-opt the eclipse for their own purposes. Uh, everybody says this is going to be a, uh, you know, th th this eclipse means is, is, a, is a symbol that the royalists are going to win their next battle. No, said the parliamentarians. It means that we're going to win our next battle. And in the middle of it all are people actually being rational and saying, look, we predict this eclipse. We know what's going to happen. It isn't, it isn't anything to get too worried about. In particular, another of my dead astronomers, that chap on the left there, the Reverend John Palmer of Ecton in Northamptonshire, uh, I watched they observe the eclipse of the sun. It wasn't total from Northamptonshire, but I thought they observed great eclipse of the sun with a minute watch rectified the azimuth of the sun uh, and the company of half a score gentlemen and ministers, my neighbours. He had an eclipse party. The rest of the world was having a civil war. John Palmer had an eclipse party. <laughs> I would have liked to have been there that day. Well, actually, I would have liked to have been in Northumberland or southern Scotland for totality. This eclipse is so great, we could read into it the, the, the time of greatest darkness, notwithstanding that the window was covered with a blanket. I think the blanket was there to make sure that they could see the partial phases through it. That's acting as a sort of, uh, they didn't have mylar in those days. Don't use a blanket. Use a, mil use a proper filter. Yeah, we kind of forget, even during the 13th century, we had pretty good predictions of eclipses. I'm not saying these were completely accurate, but they had a fairly good idea what was going on. Walter of Evendon's a, a calendar of eclipses from 1386. Uh, these, these are pretty accurate predictions. The magnitude, not great, but on the whole, when they thought there was going to be an eclipse, there was one. And that's because we already knew a lot about the, the, the motions of the sun and moon to be able to make good predictions, and had done for thousands of years. It's my favorite. John Steele from uh, Brown University writes about sort of uh, ancient uh, civilizations and the various things that they do for predicting eclipse. And this is my favorite story. It's King Esarhaddon of Assyria. Makes a, he's a real character. He makes a couple of appearances in the Old Testament. And the ritual they decided, there was an eclipse coming up, and the ritual they decided to perform was called the substitute king ritual. So they find a substitute king, convicted criminal, political enemy, or economist commoner placed on the throne, giving the trappings of office uh, so that all the associ evil associated with the eclipse would be taken on by the substitute. 
Anything wrong, wrong, went wrong, substitutes false. It's, uh, it, the real king that cloistered away in a special house where he would be addressed as the farmer, not the king, the farmer, undergo a range of claims and rituals after a set time period, in theory lasting 100 days, but in practice a little bit less. Substitute king would be sent to his fate, and the real king could come back onto the throne. And uh, anything that went wrong thereafter, substitute king's fault. <laughs> well, exactly. Count me in. I mean, this sounds like a great job, yeah? yeah they, you're, you, you, you get to sit on the throne for a few days, you get the keys to the wine cellar and the harem, and all you've got to do is, is creep out while nobody's looking in the next 100 days, leg it to the border, because if you actually do make it to safety, nobody's going to admit <laughs> the substitute king went missing. Are they? So, uh, so I think this, this is a job I quite like. And you get to see an eclipse, obviously. But, uh, so there you go. And the reason they knew eclipses were happening is because they'd already identified one of the major, uh, uh, one of the major intervals that, uh, that, uh, that uh, occurred between eclipses. The Saros interval, 18 years, 11 and a third days. It might be 12 and a third or 10 and a third, depending on leap years. But essentially, if, if you have an eclipse, the sun or an eclipse of the moon, 18 years, 11 and a bit days later, you get another one. And the Babylonians had figured this out by looking at lunar eclipses and then figuring out that the same applied to solar eclipses. So it wasn't 100% certain, but they could figure out that eclipses were quite likely to happen. Uh, and this beautiful, Michael Zyler put this great, uh, these are all the eclipses of the 21st century categorized by Saros series. So the one that's coming up this year in the United States is Saros 139, which I think is round here. Uh, and it's a good Saros. All of them, all the way around, they're all, uh, it's one of these ones around here, where they're all total eclipses. And they're all long duration total eclipses, uh, four minutes or so from, uh, from uh, Mexico and from Texas, where I shall be. And they, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, and uh, some Saroses are really good. Uh, some Saroses are not so good at the moment, uh, but getting better. Our Australian one was down here somewhere, and we've got a couple of hybrids, and it starts becoming, I think it's this one here, a couple of hybrids, and then it starts becoming total. So uh, we, 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 there's such, so much periodicity to eclipses, uh, and uh, to the credit, the first great uh, precise scientific discovery of mankind, perhaps, was this periodicity of eclipses, the Saros period. And there are others, the NX period of 29 years and so on. Um, uh, so we, we wrote a giant chapter about uh, the how and the why of eclipses. And then, as uh, I say, Tom had brought me on board to explain how, <laughs> why is it some people are so nerdy that they do nothing but go around the world to see eclipses of the sun. So I, you know, I definitely tell them all about the eclipses I've seen and the wonderful things that I've seen along the way. We've been to some fantastic places around the world and get some absolutely beautiful pictures. And every eclipse is different. Uh, this was taken by uh, Philip Lopez, uh, I stood not too far away from him, on Ternate in the, in the Spice Islands of Indonesia, looking across the Halmahira. And you get this beautiful perspective across the ocean uh, with the scuddy clouds, which are about to interrupt the end of totality, but never mind, and this gorgeous sunset on the right, the yellow and red. Except, of course, it's not a sunset. <laughs> it's a, the sun is up there, covered by the moon, but somehow or other conditions are right, that the light from the sun going into the partial area to the south, but not the north, is giving us a beautiful sunset. So that's my overwhelming memory of that particular eclipse, as those gorgeous sky colours. You shouldn't just be concentrating on the corona and the prominences and so on. <coughs> gorgeous those are, those are. Take your time to look around and to take a look at, the, uh, take a look at everything else that is going on. There's so much to reward you in those few minutes of totality. So, we put together a book, uh, and the idea, is, uh, 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 as after we'd all put our, our chapters together, was one of the other deliverables was to try and uh, try and meet up uh, and to get some sort of uh, swapping of ideas between the various uh, between the various disciplines. Uh, it, you know, part, part of the idea of the whole project was to try and introduce into subject disciplinarity, uh, and these meetings were supposed to happen, perhaps in the UK and London, and perhaps in the US, and maybe we'll be able to move between the two first ones of which were planned for 2020. We all know what happened. Actually, that kind of brought us together, I think, is that uh, instead of there being a, a US meeting and a UK meeting, is we all met up over Zoom. And, and that worked pretty well. You know, and you know, I, 
to me, coming in as almost the, non the only non-academic on the project, is that uh, uh, it was great fun to be able to discuss Dante with a Dante scholar, uh, uh, civil war politics with, uh, with you know, a historian who specialized in that area. I, I had a wonderful time. And at the same time, you know, we, we were able to figure out what stars and planets would be visible in the sky in 1133. It's, you know, we, can, we can provide information that the historians don't necessarily know. But we we're going to try and have a, a proper launch conference uh, which we schedule for 2022 for the Solar Eclipse Conference. Uh, in a year when there is no solar eclipse, we try, the solar eclipse community tries to organize a conference somewhere of interest in the world everybody can go along to. And this was going to happen to the northeast of Madrid, which will be on the, uh, on the eclipse track for 2026, the next but one total eclipse. Uh, and uh, we, we encourage members of the group to, to, uh, to sign up for it. I certainly did. Unfortunately, things went wrong again. First of all, the Eclipse Conference was cancelled. I'd already bought the plane, plane tickets, but never mind. I had a long weekend in, in Madrid instead. Uh, but our two, uh, the, the, the two, uh, two other astronomers, as it were, scientists on the, on the, on the, on the group, uh, Jay Pasikoff fell ill, and then Tom McLeish fell ill. And uh, I, I don't know how many of you know Jay, but uh, Jay passed away with lung cancer not too long afterwards. He was keeping it quite well hidden. And this is, this is somebody who'd seen every eclipse going for decades on end, a sore loss to the eclipse community, a great communicator, great historian, great scientist. And then Tom, who had also fallen ill, and uh, it turned out he had pancreatic cancer as well, and he passed away oh, just over, just under a year ago, at the end of February in 2023. Uh, again, a huge loss, and to those of us who knew him personally, well, I knew both Jay and, and Tom very well, but uh, Tom for, for many decades. Uh, which kind of left me as the last astronomer standing. Uh, so uh, uh, Tom and Henrika got in touch with me to say, Tom's not going to be well enough to do all the editing of the book. Can you take this on board? So that's what I've been doing for the last year, is bringing this thing to a conclusion, doing all the technical editing, telling people who are a lot better qualified than I am that they don't understand eclipses. But uh, uh, they do mostly, but some, some bits of it are wrong. Uh, but they, the book finally came together. We have a... Uh, a, a book page for it, uh, coming out, so they say, February 6th in the UK, a little bit later in the United States. I'm very pleased to say, even, even on the advanced ones, it's actually selling as a, one, of the, one of the advanced selling science books. So we're really rather hopeful that it will, uh, that it will do OK. Uh, I should be giving a, a slightly different version of this at AstroFest. Uh, they want to say more about upcoming eclipses, which I, I could talk for hours on, but apparently I've only got 30 minutes. Uh, but I'll conclude this. It has been an extraordinary extraordinary project to work on, meeting, so, meeting up with two people who are so, know so much about areas that I know nothing about and reaching the, the common knowledge that we have uh, about uh, solar eclipses of the sun. So I will shut up at this point so you can ask me some questions if you want. But I will conclude with, well, two great friends of mine uh, in, uh, in memoriam of Jay and Tom. I, th I, th I hope most of you all know Jay and some of you have, have come across Tom. Uh, I was going to say rest in peace for both of them, but Henrika pointed out Jay is from the Jewish tradition. Tom, in the wonderfully austere chapel at, uh, at Emmanuel, is from the Christian tradition. So may their, may their memory be a blessing, may they rest in peace, and in the memory to them, Eclipse and Revelation coming out soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike. There's so many aspects to eclipses, aren't there? I, I've got a friend in the West of London Astronomical Society who's also a um, member of the Institute of Physics who's done a study of uh, the colour of the sky during solar eclipses. And uh, that's uh, research never, never been reported elsewhere so far. Everything is different. Everything you think you know about the way the world operates changes subtly during the total eclipse. The shadows... It's silver, it becomes wintry. It's, uh, and it, uh, it, it all, it's all very disconcerting, particularly if you're seeing it for the first time. And if you're seeing it for the first time and don't know it's happening, it must be absolutely bewildering. Mm. Questions? Any questions? Discussions? <laughs> yeah, you bamboozled. But uh, I know some, some, some of the people here have seen quite a lot of eclipses. James is probably on Cubics. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Right, well, well thank you again for a uh, splendid talk, and best of luck with the, <coughs> how the book does. Yeah. Right. Thank you. We've got our tea break shortly, which is scheduled to occur between 4 and 4.30. It may or may not be ready yet, but you can wander out there. And uh, we'll get back together at 4.30, and we have talks from um, uh, Mary McIntyre on her adventures in uh, astronomy outreach, and then Nick James on the forthcoming events in the sky, in sky notes. So I'll see you all after the tea break. Thank you. Let us start again, ladies and gentlemen. Please sit down, Professor Leatherbarrow, and uh, everybody. Mary. Mary has joined us. Mary McIntyre has joined us <laughs> on the... Um, on the live feed from Oxfordshire. No. I expect she is. She had her birthday yesterday. Did you have a nice birthday? Um, are, the, are, the, are the cats doing okay? Did they enjoy your birthday? So Mary is a very well-known uh, popularizer and observer as well, but popularizer of astronomy. She gives around 50 lectures a year uh, on ast astronomy and astrophotography. Uh, she also talks about the history of women in astronomy, atmospheric optics, uh, and other subjects. And she often talks to the uh, non-astronomy groups, people like the WI and the University of the Third Age and Cubs and Scouts. She's got a YouTube channel, and she's been on the radio, uh, podcasts, and she's even run outreach events in her back garden. And she writes for Sky at Night magazine, and she's uh, been writing for another book, which is coming out soon, I believe. It's been keeping her busy. And uh, so she does a tremendous amount uh, in spite of her mobility issues. It makes it difficult for her to get about. Uh, and um, anyway, uh, today uh, she's very kindly agreed at quite short notice because uh, uh, we had a, a, a cancellation of a speaker who was previously... Uh, due to speak, but to, uh, quite short notice, she's agreed to talk to you over, over uh, Zoom, and she's going to now tell you about her adventures in astronomical outreach. So, Mary McIntyre. subject and helping people to understand it that are within the community rather than within the scientific community already but I still feel that there are a lot of new members and beginners within astronomy societies who benefit from the outreach events that those societies put on so even when I'm doing a talk to an astro society if there is a new member in the audience like there was last night in a talk I gave they are gaining an outreach benefit from that so while mostly it's focused outside of astro societies 
Um, it is helping to provide informal contributions to science education, and that could be to anybody. But the kind of groups that we're talking about, um, talking or the, the events that we're doing is things like public lectures or lectures in general. We could be visiting schools, which is something I do a lot of. Workshops for teachers, I've kind of helped teachers behind the scenes who were struggling with teaching GCSE astronomy. They've been thrown in after a teacher had left. I've, um, I'm going to be talking at a conference for teachers later this year and workshops for students and also home ed groups. There is a massive misconception that home educated children are isolated people that don't mix with other people and they're stuck at home all day. There are so many amazing home educating communities, certainly within Oxfordshire, that, that they're socialising more than conventional classroom children are, quite honestly, and they're gaining so much enrichment from that. And I have worked with them doing private astronomy lessons or going to their camps or open days, just basically whenever I can, I will support the home ed people just as much as I will conventional schools. And that's schools of all ages. I've taught um, sketching workshops to children that are doing sketching as part of astronomy GCSE but equally I go to primary schools and do it so it's amazing to do that beavers cubs and scouts I do all sorts with them and um, if any of you are thinking of doing this I know people have said oh I've said no because I don't know enough about astronomy I can guarantee you you know more than the six-year-olds that are sitting in front of you if you're doing your beavers thing and you just don't know who you're inspiring when you do these things if you are going to do something with beavers cubs and scouts make sure you've read up about black holes because that's all they ever want to talk about and when the sun is going to explode well, it's not going to explode but they think it is um when the sun is going to expand and suck up the earth that's kind of what they're into <laughs> and, and it's kind of crazy and some of the questions that they ask are things I can't answer but in general they are and they have badges that they do space badges astronomy badges and if you're con like concerned that you're not going to teach them the right thing the cubs website the scouts website actually has a list of things they're supposed to be doing in order to get that badge I don't think I've ever once been asked to do those things they tend to say can you do a talk on stars or can you do this other thing or can we do an activity on constellations and so I'll just do what they ask me to do and if that means they get a badge great but if you have a scout group that do want to follow the procedure it's clearly listed on their website to help you and doing things like science fairs and festivals there have been festivals in high schools and other things where I've had a stall and just kind of having something like a scale model of the earth and the moon and asking people to stand how far apart they are to scale and having a bit of string even something as simple as that really kind of numbers and distances mean nothing to the majority of people um adults included but you get a bit of string and a model of the sun and the moon you're good they'll they'll be on board they'll understand how big space is online resources and activities again is another important one and i do have a lot of social media presence i have youtube i don't have as much time to dedicate to that as i'd like because there is only one of me but where possible i will do online stuff and during the pandemic i did a lot of online talks online sketching workshops and stuff like that so there is a lot that you can do so i want to kind of go through in groups i've tried to kind of group it but it's difficult because a lot of it kind of tends to be a bit of everything so how the kind of public speaking about astronomy first began for me was on the 27th of February 2014. I was out in the garden in my pyjamas with a telescope and I looked to the north and thought, oh, that light pollution haze is terrible tonight. Everything's so red and fuggy. And then carried on looking the opposite way, taking pictures of the Orion Nebula. My husband, Mark, messaged me. Mary, people have seen Aurora from South Wales. Have you got it? And I looked over and realised, oh, that's what I'd actually seen and hadn't even realised. So camera got switched that way, trudged up the hill with my crutches, got these photographs. I had no idea how to photograph Aurora. My time lapse was atrocious, but it really kind of spoke to the wider community because Aurora had been seen from Oxfordshire and this was something they hadn't experienced before. So suddenly I was on the radio talking about it. And once a local radio station knows they can call you and knows that you have a bit of knowledge and are capable of speaking coherently they will ring you for everything if there's anything exciting happened they will call you and ask if you want to talk about it so that's really good because on the back of that and um, this also ended up in the local newspaper 
and again for a long time local press would constantly contact me and I would end up kind of half writing their articles for them to explain what was coming up with a meteor shower they would then change something and say I'd said something that I hadn't which is just a one of those things that happens with local press they know what they want to say and no matter what you tell them they will still say it even if it's wrong so that does get frustrating but ultimately even if the information is a little bit wrong it's getting people out to go and look at that meteor shower or a potential aurora display so i kind of became not, not famous but well known within local media and it was all just a bit weird and we ended up with um in th this the lunar eclipse in 2015 a radio box for dj came to my house and was in the garden with me all night um recording different bits of the different parts of the eclipse and this was the first time i experienced one of the pitfalls of doing this and that is that you're so focused on the outreach side the communication side that your imaging suffers and i hadn't really realized the focus had slipped on my telescope in the observatory because I was busy dealing with having a DJ in the garden. So my pictures approaching totality are terrible. Um, I know I could have done so much better, but by the time I realized that had happened, the moon was too dim for me to be able to do anything about it. I was imaging with a digital SLR. I just couldn't get it to show up on screen. So that is a pitfall. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of that stuff at the very end, but it was still an amazing opportunity in breakfast show the next day, just replaying little bits of that. And if you do get known within your local radio station that is the kind of thing you can do and it is again just popularizing astronomy now the weird thing that happened that was so surreal is we went to the usa in 2017 to see the total eclipse our first total eclipse the local i don't know how they know i think they follow me on twitter they found out that this was our honeymoon and the next thing like the day we're driving to the airport there's a picture of our wedding in the local newspaper saying well oh, we're going to take a real honeymoon then we saw the eclipse which was absolutely amazing and radio oxford wanted to do a live skype chat with me the following day i have never been more sleep deprived in my life as i was that day with the traffic and the traveling and jet lag i have no memory of doing that interview but i did it and everyone in the village said oh you was gushing i have no idea i've never heard it don't remember doing it but again it was really good the community were excited that we'd been to see that and I still think it's weird. Why would anybody want to hear about me and Mark going to America to see an eclipse? But it just kind of gets people interested. And that's what I do it for. I want people to be excited about this stuff. Um, on the, again, because the local press knew me, I ended up getting contacted when Hubble had a problem a few years ago. And they said, could I go on Five Live and talk about Hubble? I was like, what I know about Hubble, I could write on a postage stamp. I know that it does great images. It's been there for 30 years and an amazing female astronaut fixed it. So I was very quickly reading up as much as I could on Hubble. And again, you don't need a lot of information. They don't want detailed scientific information in these things. So I did this short thing in the Oxford studios which went out on five live and I'm like what what's going on why do they want to talk to me about this but it was an amazing opportunity to do it and again just getting people excited and reminding them that Hubble is an amazing thing and we should be really grateful to have it and of course James Webb now um, there was another thing that I ended up doing on Radio 4, and that was um, as much as I loathe satellite mega constellations, I hate them so much. I used to love watching Iridium flares, and I became a bit of an Iridium flare train spotter and was trying to get photographs of every single one that was still in orbit before they all got deorbited. There are now no flaring Iridium satellites up there. There are satellite flares, but they're not Iridium satellites. So... On the back of this, there was a huge community of people that were doing the Catch the Iridium project. And I got a mission badge and all sorts. And they were just collated photographs of all of the Iridium flares and tried to get the whole network on this website. And on the back of that, I've met some lifelong best friends. And we did this thing on Radio 4 about why I liked them and how special they were. And they were special because they were unusual and quite rare and lasted a couple of seconds. There was not train one after the other going across the sky. So it was a very, very different thing from what we're seeing now with satellites. So again, why would anyone on Radio 4 be remotely interested in the end of the Iridium flare? era but they wanted to talk about it so i was happy to do that 
um, on the back again of all the BBC stuff and writing for Sky at Night, um, one of the articles I wrote was about how to set up a, a GMN meteor camera. And I ended up on the actual Sky at Night TV show last year. Again, just so surreal to me. But on the back of that, more people looking to set up cameras. And that's what it's for. It's about promoting meteor science and other areas of astronomy so i think that is still on iplayer it's the one will an asteroid wipe out earth episode i think it was called um the gmm project have actually got an outreach project going on and as part of this a steam project i'll talk about steam as opposed to stem in a second but this is basically schools across europe are going to have meteor cameras and they're using the gmm meteor cameras as a vehicle for teaching coding for teaching astronomy for teaching everything to do with the camera systems and the different things you can do and also some art activities so i've been helping as much as i can writing some of the learning modules for that from the astronomy side more than the meteor science side so that's been amazing to be a part of that and i you know i'm still working on material for that which is great and hopefully i'll be able to do some talks in schools once those cameras are up and running across europe in terms of outreach events kind of locally um i promote astronomy regularly i run our village email notices system therefore i abuse that power and i send out so much information about upcoming events and people love it i get stopped in the street all the time saying thank you we saw the space station or whatever thing happened to be going on in um, 2015 in march we had a partial solar eclipse and we decided to open up our garden bought a load of coffee a load of croissants and just said we're having breakfast in the garden we're going to have some safe solar telescopes set up if you want to come and have a look at the eclipse safely you can do and we were overwhelmed like we had over 50 people turn up even though it was a weekday on a school day some people kept their children out of school so they could come and see it and it was amazing and there are children in the village that came to that event that are still into astronomy today and very often you don't know who you've inspired and knowing of a couple of people that I have inspired by doing this is amazing. And I did this as well for the Mercury transit, ruined my imaging of the Mercury transit. There's been two and I did an outreach event for one of them and it completely trashed my imaging opportunities. But you, you kind of have to sacrifice that for the greater good sometimes. Whenever we have the village pop-up pub on the field in the summer here, I if there's a clear night and the moon's around, I take a telescope so people can just come and have a look, do sidewalk astronomy. I've taken solar scopes to our village horse show before now. When my younger stepson was in a choir, the annual choir barbecue, loads of children, families take the solar scopes if it's a sunny day so everyone gets a chance to just have a look something they probably won't get a chance to see otherwise so I just grab any opportunity like that that I can to just take a telescope somewhere now in terms of talks um my very first talk was nine years ago this month and it was not to an astronomy society it was to our village history group so I put together a talk on astronomy past and present which is a talk I still do I did it last night in fact a vast subject to condense into a one-hour talk especially for a non-astronomy audience but I loved it and I, I've always enjoyed doing presentations but this was the first time I've been asked to do one about astronomy and I loved it I'm not a historian I'm not Mike you know I don't have the knowledge that Mike Frost has but I do love teaching aspects of this whether it be the history of women or whatever subject people want me to talk about really or something that grabs my attention so that kind of started that off and at the time I was doing quite a lot of astrophotography I still do there were not as many people doing that back then and astrophotography courses in Banbury were running regular Saturday morning sessions where people could come and learn astrophotography so they asked me to put together a beginner's guide like aimed at complete novices and just to dispel some of the myths that you can't do astronomy unless you've got X, Y, and Z equipment. And these have been so popular. We don't do them anymore, but at the time they were running, the beginner's one was by far the most popular. And actually on the back of this, um, doing just small subject talks like about star trails photography or Milky Way photography, they really appeal to photographic clubs. So 
most of my astrophotography talks are for a non-astronomy audience and they love learning about that stuff and realizing they can do some astrophotography even without a telescope so astrophotography courses kind of started the the like the really big number of talks that i was doing and it was really great to be able to do that so if you are wanting to do talks, there are a lot of speakers on the circuit. You need to have a variety of talks under your belt so that there'll be a lots of different aspects. So if they've already had an astrophotography talk that season, they might want something a bit different. And I make sure that a lot of my talks appeal to non-astronomy groups, things like what the space the benefits we've gained from the space program for example history of women in astronomy wi clubs love that just loads of different things atmospheric optics is interesting to everybody there's just a wide variety of stuff on my website that appeals to a lot of people so as well as astro societies and there is the astronomy speakers website that you can get yourself onto local history societies love those kind of local stories so if there is an astronomer from your local area you could research them talk about that or just a general area of history of astronomy and um, camera clubs and photographic societies absolutely anything to do with imaging whether it's telling your story of going to the eclipse whether it's just showing your favorite astronomy pictures or technical stuff and one thing i do that i think is unusual is if i do a practical talk for a camera club i've written free pdf summary guides it's like a little pdf book that they get for free so that when they go out and have a go they've got something to refer to because i i want people to learn from me i don't want to just stand there and say look i've done this awesome thing and not tell them how to do it it's all about teaching other people university of the third age e3a they love astronomy talks they're such an amazingly switched on engaging group um women's institute as i said the, the particularly the history of women in astronomy but they've also been interested in constellation mythology um, talks that i do rotary clubs church groups and also secular societies these are all groups that i've done talks for and a lot of these have come through work Word of mouth somebody was in a history group meeting who happened to be in a camera club and they happened to be in this other club and it kind of snowballs quite quickly without you even trying sometimes so the next kind of batch the visiting schools workshops beavers and stuff like that i'm kind of lumping it into one thing here because it's impossible to break it apart in the time frame that i've got as I said earlier, we, we can all be role models for the younger generation. And if you get the opportunity to do something for a group of beavers, cubs or scouts, please say yes. Especially if you're female, because they need to see women doing this stuff um, for astronomy. And they are such an engaging group of people. Like they, they are not afraid to ask questions. I obviously don't have many photographs of doing these things for safeguarding reasons, but these um, obviously are not showing any children's faces. So I've done so many beavers, cubs and scouts things now. This was a home ed festival that I did last summer. Now, my mobility is going downhill quite rapidly. I don't think I could do this again. Um, my wheelchair wouldn't get around in this farmer's field very well. But this was amazing. I was doing a sketching workshop and we had the telescope set up. It was a first quarter moon. So the moon was visible pretty much the whole afternoon and into the evening up on the side of a hill in Chilton and just basically looking at the sunset by the campfire it just doesn't get any better it was just the most amazing thing and the children are so engaging and not scared to ask questions and this was a full week long home ed camp that that this was involved with so thank you to my friend claire for letting me show the pictures of her two younger children looking through the telescope using the eq um the altas mount sorry the sky watcher altas mount that i bought with the um prize money now, we're all very aware of STEM and promoting STEM subjects in the younger generation. So what we should be doing as well is STEAM, or actually instead of. So the science, technology, engineering and maths is something we're all very familiar with. But the A stands for art. In engineering and technology, if you're not creative and you're not able to pull together some kind of artistic endeavor, draw a picture, create a diagram, you're not going to be a very good engineer. And also... 
that, that traditional way of teaching astronomy in a stilted way can kind of put certain people off. You can teach so much through art and craft, like children don't even realise what they're learning, but you can find so many learning opportunities by doing art and craft. So I do a lot of astronomy sketching. I do it at the eyepiece as well as from photographs because I'm just inspired by space. I just love it. I think it's beautiful. So I had to relearn how to do pencil sketches during the pandemic so I could still continue to teach that online. And I'm grateful for that because pastels are my go to and I just completely abandoned pencil for the moon. But I've kind of taught it to myself again and I've done so many workshops online and um, teaching that but pastels is where my heart lies and I do a lot of kind of teaching of this and I've got photographs that I take out with me and basically I've invested an eye-watering amount of money on art materials out of my own pocket but it's been worth it because the results that people produce everybody is capable of producing a picture of a lunar crater you just need to start at the beginning and let them understand it doesn't matter if it doesn't look identical to the picture if you want something that looks like the picture take a photograph if you're doing this for pleasure accuracy is not as important it's not a scientific drawing so getting people to understand that is the first step and just giving them the confidence to try it so my first workshops were actually at solar sphere festival so i did that for a couple of years using their materials and my photographs but since then i've done world space week events stuff in schools i'm going on monday to a school to do a sketching workshop and i love it so so much um dark sky festivals and actually the best results come from non-astronomers because they don't have that hang up about it not looking completely accurate this this was Starfest last year and the results were just mind blowing. These people were artists who'd never done an astronomy sketch before. And even though like you can see Plato on all of these, it stands out as the same crater, but no two drawings are the same. And that's how it should be. It, everyone has their own unique drawing style and people should embrace that and just be happy with the pictures that they've produced. And I was genuinely really emotional putting these things together, the collages after this event, because they were just beautiful. The galaxies as well and and some of the children go off and do their own thing they make their own constellations their own galaxies there's usually a spaceman thrown in there somewhere and it's just wonderful to do this and you don't have to be a good artist yourself to run these sorts of workshops and these could all be photographs like again no two are identical but it's so obvious what we're looking at here so yeah i love the horsehead nebula and being able to teach people how to draw that was just amazing as well as drawing, model making is something that I've done quite a lot of and a kind of craft activities for Sky at Night DIY projects. This was a model of asteroid Eros. So the near shoemaker photos are on the left and the one on the right is my salt dough, just made out of simple salt dough. Just modeling it, looking at the pictures, trying to get the terrain to look the same and then photograph it under the same lighting conditions. So many learning opportunities there, photography wise and actual crafting wise. You can do a lot with cotton wool and cardboard. Like this is a 3D model of a comet made from a cone, a polystyrene ball and some cotton wool and a pipe cleaner. But it really looks like a comet. It was based on Comet Neowise. Um, just making models of galaxies using cotton wool and cardboard. And then you can put a black hole in the middle of this. You can put a mark where our solar system is. So people immediately have a visual re like memory of where we are in the grand scheme mm -hmm. of things. And you can do that with the most simple simple cheap materials that you've probably already got at home if you haven't got access to polystyrene balls you can just cut two circles of card out and interlock them and then spend ages drawing all the surface features and make a mobile and um, this diorama was one of my favorite things that I've ever made again polystyrene balls and some string and an old box you know this is stuff that you have lying around and children learn so much by making these things I made a sundial from two pieces of cardboard and a straw. So that was an amazing one. And I've been tweeted pictures of people doing that with their grandchildren, which just makes my year. Um, and doing these things, showing how eclipses work, obviously not to scale, but you can see the umbra and penumbra region just by using two balls, two polystyrene balls and a lamp. But then you can use it as a geography learning experience because you've painted the, the countries and the continents and all of that stuff. And if you want to, you can even do the lunar surface drawing on the, the moon model 
it's just so much fun and th this was another of my favorites a light up constellation board you're learning the shape of the constellations looking at any nebulosity in that area and then it lights up at night which is just so much fun this was the most fun I've had in a weekend in quite some years. I don't get out much, um, but this is an activity that you can do if um, you're OK with cleaning up afterwards. But if you've got a pan with flour in it, dust cocoa powder on top and just lob different size balls into it, you can show in real time how lunar craters form, how the ejector blanket forms, how the ejector rays can form and just what a mega kind of amount of energy is involved in these impact events. And if you do want to go down and then video it and create these sort of animations so much fun i honestly had a ball filming that so in terms of providing online resources as i said i do have a youtube channel i have twitter facebook page instagram um i'm now on mastodon as well so i try to promote stuff through those but on youtube as well as sharing time lapses and kind of vlogs i also try to do the odd bit of tutorial stuff on there so just little snippets of different photography techniques and stuff like that and people get a lot of benefit from watching those and you know i'm happy to show people how to do things with budget equipment that's kind of my big mantra this happened yesterday um i got contacted by a fact checking site asking me to help debunk a, an absolutely bonkers video that was claiming mars must be fake because their out of focus blob on a compact camera didn't look like nasa pictures so you just don't know who's watching you online who's seen your pictures and you can kind of get involved with stuff like this so I have written for Sky at Night magazine for quite a long time now. I've also contributed regularly to the Yearbook of Astronomy. And off the back of all of these things I've done, my name got put forward to help um, write the Colin Stargazing Bible, which is coming out in September 2024. And this is aimed at beginners. And there are so many amazing activities in here. And it's been so much work. I, I've never worked so many hours in my life, but it's been amazing. And co-writing that with um, Ian Ridpath, like, which is just mind blown again so all of these things have kind of snowballed so just to summarize outreach is amazing and rewarding but be aware that if you're working with children it's advisable and usually essential for certain schools to get an annual um, dbs check a disclosure and barring service just to make sure that you don't have any criminal records that would block that if you are running it like a legitimate public event, as in advertising it widely, you need to have the right insurance and risk assessments, et cetera. In our village, when the village was quite small, this was our village friends coming around and we happened to have some telescopes. If I advertise on the local radio that we're doing an event, you have to have all of this stuff in place. You, you can't do that without insurance. You, if you are using your own equipment like I am, there is a damage risk and I've, I've had many breakages and losses and stuff like that. You just have to absorb that if you're going to just accept it for the greater good. I never take our super expensive telescope on an outreach event. The solar scope goes with us, but that's kind of small. The big trip like doublet or triplet refractors, they stay at home. I just use my my non apochromatic refractor for outreach. Uh, if you can try and work within an established astronomy club because most of them do outreach events anyway and they'll be covered by the insurances and that stuff and remember as i said before you're going to sacrifice your own imaging if you're busy looking after a group of people when we had a bright aurora display on the 5th of november last year my camera caught everything i saw it was happening i spent ages inside fighting with mailchimp trying to get an email out to the village to go out and look now i missed the big outburst of that it was on my pictures but i missed seeing it visually because i was busy trying to tell other people about it and i was so annoying but loads of people got to see the aurora that night because of it so you do just kind of have to accept that's going to happen i think it's totally worth it very often you have no idea who you've inspired but an amazing thing happened for me last year the end of um, 2022 i did a talk at the fas convention and in the audience was a mum and a daughter and in that talk, it was actually about the history of women in astronomy, but I showed like one or two slides showing some of my pastel sketches. Completely out of the blue, I got tweeted on it was still Twitter back then, um, saying that uh, just thought I'd like to know that her daughter is using my art as an inspiration for part of her art GCSE. And I was like, what <laughs> i was like mind blown so she said have you got any tips so i said right you guys come to the house so we we just did a 
like they brought the dog gorgeous dog and we sat and did some lunar drawing she didn't need my help she's an amazingly talented artist anyway but it was a really fun thing to do and she did this amazing work for her art GCSE and has now gone on to do A-level art. And this is amazing. You more often than not never find out about this. And But even if you don't know, there will be somebody that this has happened to on the back of you doing something for outreach. So please do think about doing more outreach if you're not doing that already. So sorry if I've overrun, um, but I will stop there and see if anyone has questions. Thank you, Mary. That's absolutely fantastic. Uh, a question actually has come up on the YouTube uh, channel. And it's Kevin Kell says, sounds like Mary has a great little village. How big is your village? Um, uh, bigger than it was, there's probably about five or 600 houses here so um, because they've just built a load more. Um, but it is a fairly good community here. Um, everyone's lovely and supportive and yeah, grateful, grateful for, for the opportunity to learn more about astronomy. So, yeah, I'm really grateful to live here. So, any other questions from the audience here in the IOP? Are, you're, yes, uh, sorry. Okay. Yes, uh, Janice. Uh, how would you tie in the BAA then in all of this site, which if we were <laughs> doing this stuff? Because, you know, that, that is our issue, is making... <laughs> We can do, and a lot of people do do these things, but um, <coughs> how do you do it in the name of the BAA? <laughs> um, I, I don't know if there is an official group at this point that kind of coordinates BAA-centred outreach. That would be a really good thing, I think, um, that would kind of make sure that anyone that is doing outreach can have access to more resources and more people. I am just me doing it to absolute beginners and primarily non-astronomers for the most part for what I'm doing. So I'm not really tying it in with any organization. I do obviously talk about the BAA and the SPA when people show more interest, but mostly what I'm doing is trying to get people to start looking up not get excited about Starlink satellites, and then to get their telescopes out of the shed that have been gathering dust for years because they didn't know how to use it or didn't think that they could use it. So that's kind of where I'm coming from really with what I'm doing, but I would love to do more and have access to more resources because I'd make all my own handouts, my own activity sheets, and it's a lot of work. So if there was a kind of official outreach group, I think it would be really beneficial for people like me to tie it all together. We've, been, we've just been discussing that at the BAA Council today, so uh, I, we, are, we are hoping to get together a team to, uh, to coordinate all that. <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, anything, any, any other <coughs> contributions? I certainly agree that you have to have a dedicated telescope that you only use for these <coughs> events. I've got a telescope I take to public events, which is a uh, a hundred millimeter refractor, which is fairly bomb proof, and I take it on the <laughs> London Underground. I'll show you pictures in the journal of that. Actually. And yeah, you don't you don't want to take anything too expensive, and ex you don't want to take expensive eyepieces or things that can easily get lost like that. But um, yes, it's um, it, it's it's worth it in the end. So, well, I, last year as a kind of desk ornament, I bought the tiny little Heritage Dobsonian and I'm blown away by how good the views are through that. And that's really small and light. And if you've got it on a fairly stable table, it's good enough for looking at the moon for people. So that's now two telescopes I can take to events. And uh, could you ask Mary if she ever charges for her outreach activities? Do you uh, question, do you charge your outreach activities? It kind of depends on the situation. If it's a festival or um, certain schools that do have the budget, then I will charge for my time and a contribution towards the art materials because that's been a lot of money. Um, there are schools and clubs that just literally don't have the budget for it. I mean, this is my only job, this and freelance writing. So if they have the budget, I do charge a small fee, but if they don't have the budget and it's a deal breaker, I will work for free, um, which is why I'm never going to be rich because I'm more passionate about the astronomy than I am about, uh, I mean, it is my career, but 
I would rather do it for free than not do it at all. So I'm fortunate that I'm in a financial position that I can do that at this point. It's getting harder with the way things are, but you know, I don't know how long I can do it for much longer with my back how it is but as long as i can still get a little bit of something from the societies that can afford it then i will charge um i think i bring value so i think i'm worth it <laughs> yeah i think that's a good answer i think it's very very reasonable yeah that's a good question as well right uh well thank you again it's uh, lovely to see you again and hope to see you again soon and, thank you um, Another round of applause for Mary. Yeah. And uh, finally today, uh, Nick James, Comet Section Director. And uh, you know all about him because he received a big award last, uh, and I, I praised him to the hilt last That's meeting. Very good of you, David. Thank so, um, <laughs> he's uh, going to tell us everything that he knows about uh, what's coming up in the sky shortly. And probably several things I don't know either. So, um, Simon, ah, brilliant, okay. So, it's, it's not often that I praise clouds in these sky note <laughs> sessions, but um, these are, and, and except in the summer when we talk about noctilucent clouds, which are clouds very, very high up in the mesosphere, um, these are clouds, and they, they're only generally visible in the summer. These are clouds that you can see in the winter. <coughs> rare. So, yeah, if we can have the lights down as far as it's safe to go, basically. Um, <clears throat> these are what are called nacreous clouds, or mother-of-pearl clouds. And there was a really nice display of them um, in uh, just before Christmas, 21st of December. Uh, Unfortunately, that day it was cloudy where I was, but uh, this is a picture by Adam Rawlinson of these nacreous clouds. It doesn't come out too well on the screen here, but they're, they're called mother of pearl clouds. They basically you can see sort of purple and green and lots of different colours in them. So, um, so that's another kind of cloud that we as astronomers can, can potentially uh, embrace, uh, but not the kind of clouds that we had over the last two weeks of December and the first week of January when... Certainly where I was, I don't think I saw the sun for about three weeks, which is awful. Um, but the sun has been increasing in activity. This is a, a picture um, in white light from a few days ago, the 15th of January, um, showing quite a few nice spot groups. And at the moment on the BAA website, if you go, this is actually our picture of the week. A really nice picture uh, by Anton Matthews showing the sun in hydrogen alpha taken on January the 16th. So lots of detail there. And of course these days you can buy, for not huge amounts of money, although they are still quite expensive, you can buy uh, telescopes that allow you to see prominences and other features on the sun which you can't see in white light. So in terms of, you know, comparing buying a telescope that can do this to the cost of maybe going and seeing a total eclipse when you get... 30 seconds, or maybe if you're lucky, four minutes of being able to see the prominences. You can, you can see, see them all the time when it's clear. But this is taken with a telescope with a particular filter that filters out the light that you're interested in. Another interesting way of looking at the sun in monochromatic light uh, is this example here by Alan Halsey. So he's using a thing called a Solex SHG. So I've spoken quite a lot in these talks about amateur spectroscopy. And this is essentially a spectroscope. It's a spec what's called a spectroheliosope. <coughs> so it contains a diffraction grating that splits light up into lots of different wavelengths. But essentially the slit um, can be scanned across the object that you're looking at to form an image. So in days gone by, spectroheliosopes were huge things. Uh, Henry Hatfield was mentioned earlier on today. And he built a house, basically, to house his spectroheliosope. <laughs> These days, you can make spectroheliosopes that are much smaller. And uh, this Solex, actually, a lot of the components for this are 3D printed. So if you're interested in actually making one of these, you can go online and you can basically download <coughs> all the plans that allow you to make uh, your own spectroheliosope. Uh, but yeah, this is a really good example. This is looking in the light of calcium K. But because it's a spectroheliosope, you can tune the, the thing to whichever particular wavelength you're interested in. So rather than just buying a telescope with a filter that, that allows you to look at 
H alpha or calcium or whatever. This thing allows you to choose any wavelength you like, like an image the sun in monochromatic light, which I think is a really pretty neat thing. And the fact that these spectroscopes are, spectroheliscopes are actually designed by very clever people who then made their designs public uh, and you can go out and make it, I think is a really good example of, uh, of how kind of amateur astronomy advances with people doing clever things, then other people coming along and following up on it. Um, so I usually have a few nice pictures of aurorae, but there haven't been a huge number. Um, this one, though, from Callum Potter up in Rice and up in um, Orkney, uh, was taken just before Christmas, December the 18th. It's a panorama um, taken with a Sony A7 and a 21mm lens. And as Callum says, the, the software that you can get these days, which is usually really good at joining pictures together into panoramas, isn't quite so good at joining auroras and star fields because there's not a huge amount of detail there for the software to see. But um, I think that's a nice, nice example. Um, there's various people. So this is from, um, I was going to say it's from Great Britain. It's from just off the north coast of Great Britain. But a number of people have been away on their winter holes on, on ships up the coast of Norway and other places and have seen good aurorae as well. Um, just coming back to the nacreous clouds, um, Nick Hewitt here submitted an image of that too from Northampton. Um, I think that probably shows the, the colours a little bit better. And then this one again is Adam Rawlinson's picture showing, uh, showing those nacreous clouds above all of the tropospheric cumulus clouds. He was in Kent, he got quite good view uh, looking west. All of that rubbish on the horizon there is what I was under up in Essex. <laughs> Um, so let's uh, just start as well kind of with astronomical objects um, other than the sun. So the moon, uh, this is a, a picture of the moon taken in a way that uh, a lot of people do these days. And Mary was talking about outreach. And I've done quite a lot of outreach at, at schools where you, you go in kind of in the evening when the moon's in the sky, take a telescope. The, the kids are really kind of amazed by looking at the moon, but the one thing they really want to do is they want to put their phone at the eyepiece and they want to take a picture. And uh, the moon is obviously the thing to do that with, and this is what Mark Fairfax has done. He's basically stuck this at the eyepiece of his Dobsonian, um, an iPhone at the eyepiece, and we've got a really nice picture of the moon there. And it is quite amazing, modern phones. Um, it can be quite fiddly, but, but six-year-old kids seem to manage it very easily, much more easily than I can. But they can, uh, they can get really good images, and they're sort of keepsakes to take home with them. Um, so in terms of what the moon's doing, we're just coming up to full moon, uh, which will be on January the 25th, so this coming week. Um, the phases in green there are when there are various eclipses happening. So the April the 8th one is the one that we all know about. That's the total eclipse that's going to be over the US. Um, not long away now. March 25th, full moon. It's a penumbral eclipse of the moon that is visible from here. There is um, a partial eclipse of the moon then on September the 18th that's visible from here too. So we've got two lunar eclipses that we can observe from this country this year. And then on October the 2nd is an annular eclipse which is visible over the South Pacific and South America. So in two of those cases, the moon is doing its good job as an occulting disk to block out the photosphere of the sun. Um, and in the other two, the Earth is doing a good job of basically casting a shadow on the moon. The moon is a little bit more, of course, than an occulting disk. Even I would admit that. And um, very impressive images that people can get these days. This is, it's always been an interesting crater pair that has interested me. It's, um, they used to be called Messier and Pickering, but for some reason the names got changed to Messier and Messier A. But they're a very interesting pair of craters, asymmetric craters. And this picture by Dave Finnegan shows them very, very well. Um, and even I, who curse the bright moon in the sky, often um, do, do look at it. And it's a fascinating object to look at, the amount of detail that we can see and the amount of detail that people image now. Jumping a little bit to much smaller things, so the dust that comes off comets and asteroids entering our atmosphere. Um, I first showed one of these plots at the Christmas meeting, and various people asked me to, uh, to, to show some updated ones. So I'll try and do this every time I do Skynote. So this basically is showing 
from the GMN cameras that Mary mentioned uh, that people are setting up all over the place, and they are really good outreach. These are video cameras that are looking at the sky continually with soft, really clever software um, that basically make a completely automated system. So you can set these cameras up and almost forget about them. And they feed data on all the meteors that they observe into a central computer, which can calculate then, if you get meteors observed from two different locations, can calculate the meteor radiance. And what this is is a plot of those radiants in RA and DEC. So uh, basically, <coughs> that's going north, DEC up, uh, and RA is east-west. And what you see color-coded there is the geocentric entrance velocity of the radiance. And you can see that there are little clumps of stuff which are meteor showers. Now that big clump that you saw there, that red clump, which will come around again, that one there, is the Geminids, which is the, the most active meteor shower that we see in the year. It was a really good Geminid display um, last year, 2023, on December the 14th. There was no moon in the sky to cause problems, but it was cloudy over a lot of the country. And so unfortunately, a, a lot of people didn't get to experience that. But it was a very, very um, active display. And I was lucky enough to have about two hours of clear sky on the morning of December the 14th. And my meteor cameras got hundreds and hundreds of events in those two hours. But, but GMN is good because it's a global network and so it's not affected by kind of local weather. There's another clump on there, which is, uh, you'll see uh, that red clump over on the right-hand side, at a high declination. <clears throat> That's the quadrantids, and the quadrantids are again another, another active shower, but they're often not seen very much <coughs> because they take place early in January, January the, the 3rd, 4th. Uh, when the weather again isn't too good. But we were lucky over the UK to actually have some reasonably good clear skies for the quadrantids. Um, so I've got a couple of really nice pictures. This one I thought particularly good. So um, Grant uh, Privet often uses Stonehenge as a sort of foreground for his astro pictures, and I think it really works very well. So here you've got Stonehenge, Orion, Sirius, and a Geminid up in the sky there. So Really nice picture. When, when they built Stonehenge, they, they obviously didn't quite think that it would in future be used as a foreground for astrophotography, but I think it works. It works really, really well. Um, the camera of choice, if you want to actually video um, meteors, is the camera that everyone uses for low light video, and that's the Sony A7S. So if you ever see any kind of real time video of Rory, uh, that will generally be an A7S. So this Steve Knight video, really nice, <laughs> really shows what a meteor looks like in, in real time on a video. And often, if you just see a sort of still frame, you don't see this, because essentially what you're seeing is, is all of this light just gets stretched out into a line. But here you can see the train behind the meteor that's visible for a short period of time. Um, as the meteor heats up the atmosphere, ionizes uh, molecules high up in the atmosphere, which then come back together slowly to recombine, and that forms that train. So uh, that's a really nice one. And then just another example, this is a quadrantid. This is from one of my GMN cameras in Chelmsford. Um, this is a, a still that's made by the GMN software by stacking individual video frames, but you can also access the video too. Uh, but this is a nice example of that, and it's also a good example of of how these cameras work. See, these GMN cameras are quite infrared sensitive. So if you look on here, this is the familiar constellation of Auriga. You've got Capella there with the kids here. But what's this up here? You've got two bright stars in Capella, and that, that one there is, is not normally something you would see with the naked eye. It's actually a long period variable, a very red star, which is very bright in the infrared. So it shows up in these uh, stacked meteor images. So the quadrantids, uh, nice shower, an active shower, but very short. You've got, to be, you've got to be in the right place in the right time to see the quadrantids. But we had a good run this year with them. So where are we at the moment? We're, we're past the solstice. Nights are beginning to get shorter. Sun's setting a little bit later each day, although not by very much. But in the evening sky, in the west, we've got all of those familiar constellations of summer. Um, gradually disappearing. 
So Cygnus here, and for me at the moment, Cygnus is a really interesting and important constellation because it contains the most interesting comet that we've got in the sky at the moment, which I'll talk about a little bit later, Comet 12P uh, Pons Brooks. Um, but this, this is gradually dis disappearing, as is the comet in the evening sky, but it's far enough north for us that we can actually pick it up in the morning sky too. Uh, another thing that's disappearing is the planet Saturn, which is just right over here in Aquarius. Um, that's at a fairly sudden declination anyway, but it's gradually disappearing into the western sky. So it's becoming more and more difficult to image Saturn. Uh, but got a nice composite image. I think it's actually not a composite. This is just processed, uh, same video, but processed in different ways, which shows Saturn and its moons. So again, the rings of Saturn are closing up. So the next, uh, next year, when we, uh, or when Saturn comes out of conjunction again, the rings will have closed even further. And I think the ring plane crossings are in 2025 for Saturn. Um, so Saturn looks very different when the rings are, are really closed, but it's still an amazing object to see in a telescope. And if you, if you are doing outreach after the moon, it's probably the thing that makes everyone just kind of go, wow. Uh, an amazing, amazing thing for people to actually see live through an eyepiece. Of course, the brightest thing in the evening sky at the moment, really dominating the evening sky, well, apart from the moon, of course, is, is the planet Jupiter. Um, Jupiter's been around for quite a long time now. It's at a reasonable declination. It gets, it gets nice and high up. Um, you might have noticed uh, a couple of nights ago, <coughs> the moon passed it. And uh, this is uh, an image that David sent me of the moon at the top there. And that little faint thing right at the bottom is Jupiter <coughs> there. Um, but with the naked eye, that was a really striking pairing yeah. a few nights ago. Yeah. And quite Beautiful. a lot of people commented on that to me the next day in work asking what it was. <laughs> Which for a load of space engineers, I was really disappointed. <laughs> that they didn't actually know that it was Jupiter. But there you go. <laughs> so... Uh, I like this because it demonstrates something that's really interesting about Jupiter's satellites. So Jupiter's got four bright satellites, the Galileans, but three of them are in what's called an orbital resonance. So essentially, Io, um, Europa, and Ganymede have, over, over time, ended up in locked orbits with a ratio of one, two, and four. So this was sent to me by John Rogers. This is a, um, a thing that's been happening basically on Saturday nights, and the, the last good one is tonight or early Sunday morning, where you have Io, Ganymede, and Europa in this configuration. Basically, Io uh, about to go into um, eclipse, and then Ganymede and Europa transiting Jupiter. And because the, um, the orbit of uh, Ganymede is just over seven days, this thing happens every, has happened every Saturday for a while. Uh, and as I say, we're just falling out of it now. But if you if you go home and if the sky is clear tonight, have a look at Jupiter because you'll have the opportunity to see one of the last good ones like this in this series. So with uh, two of the satellites in front of Jupiter in transit, one of them just going behind. Um, so again, Peter Tickner's been taking a lot of uh, images of Jupiter, um, so really good quality images, although they, they don't look quite so good on the screen here. They're much better if you actually go online, have a look on the members' site on the BAA, you get much better quality. But just an example of, uh, of images of Jupiter taken over a, a period um, which show the rotation. Jupiter rotates in just over 10 hours, and so the rotation is very apparent over short periods. And again, if, you, if you're doing outreach, showing kids Jupiter and showing them the Galilean moons and how they move around Jupiter, it's something that in a few minutes you can actually see changes in the... Um, in the arrangement of the different moons. One thing, though, that has happened with Jupiter is that the great red spot has shrunk and shrunk and is now really the, not the great red spot anymore, it's the kind of not quite so great or, or sort of medium-sized red spot. But at the Christmas meeting, I showed an example of um, images of Jupiter taken one rotation apart, animated, and this is another example of that. And it's really interesting to see because you can see the flow of material around the great red spot um, and you can see the, the sort of relative movement of material in the, in the belts and zones of Jupiter. 
And it's something that uh, John Rogers um, sends me more and more of these things now, in that because there are more observers around who can do very high resolution of Jupiter, it's quite often that you get two uh, images, high resolution images taken at the same um, central meridian longitude that uh, one rotation apart. And they do show, they, they show really interesting features. And I remember from years and years ago when the Voyagers passed Jupiter, the sort of first images that showed rotational material around the Great Red Spot. And the, the fact that amateurs can do this uh, now without sending a spacecraft all the way to Jupiter is really impressive stuff, I think. Um, so, so this is a Martin Lewis image of Jupiter, again, with that reduced size Great Red Spot. And it illustrates something that Paul's going to get very angry with me in a minute, is the, the fact that if you're trying to compare images of planets, there's no real agreement as to whether they should be north up or south up. So this one happens to be south up. The previous ones were north up. And to give you an example of why that matters, this is a, a nice little video by Mike Fuchs of um, Io and Europa uh, going into um, occultation behind Jupiter. Now, this is a north-ish up. In fact, north is kind of that way-ish. And then Paul happened to send me a drawing that was making it made at exactly the same time, which in order that you can compare it with the image, I've had to turn upside down. I'm sure I know that. <laughs> True. Now, if I, if, I, if I had made a little bit more effort, I could have cut Jupiter out of the middle of that and turned it upside down without turning the text up and down. But it was just to, just to illustrate that it would be nice if planetary observers could actually agree to use North up like everyone else does. But anyway, yeah, so this is uh, an example of a drawing of, of Jupiter. And I think it's great that Paul continues the tradition of drawing as do a few people. <laughs> we could do. In fact, we could spend an hour on council discussing it, though. <laughs> yeah. um, this is really good. So this is north up as well. This is essentially taking images of Jupiter and unraveling them into a kind of Mercator map of Jupiter. So you've got the, the great red or the little red spot here. And it really kind of demonstrates in this projection that the red spot actually is really quite small now. It doesn't extend over many, long, uh, many degrees of longitude of Jupiter. So whether that's going to be a thing that continues and maybe will be the last generation or two to actually have a red spot or whether it will revive, I don't know. But um, it, it's certainly continuing to shrink. as to why it's shrinking. Well, I mean, it's, it's a weather feature, isn't it? So weather features are not permanent anyway. I mean, the, the, the amazing thing is that it's been there for so long, I suppose. I mean, that you can have a cyclonic feature like that in the atmosphere of a planet that is so stable that it's been there for hundreds of years. But there's no particular reason why it should last forever. Because there's no, there's no surface of Jupiter for it that's causing it. But we will find out, I suppose. You know, come back in 100 years and we'll, we'll see. <laughs> that's, well, there's no surface. That's the point of your question. Well, there's no land for it to fall on. Is it, is okay. it simply ejections as well, which are painful ejections? Yeah, but so, so there's lots of other things in the, uh, oh, okay. on those latitudes. Um, so there's one in the north. Yeah. Uh, it's very odd. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah. the country scientist in my department. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Nobody, nobody knows. But I mean, it's been a very long-lived. It's been there. It's been there for at least. Uh, it's probably not two. the same spot that was. Do you think? So, do you think? Uh, right. Uh, but it's certainly, certainly been there for. Hundred and fifty, two hundred years. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah.
it's difficult to see on this screen, but uh, this part, which is the night side, is being illuminated by Jupiter. So if you imagine that you're sitting on Io, Jupiter is a huge disk in the sky, very bright. And so this is essentially Jupiter shine over this side. And you can actually see some features beyond the Terminator here. But the most interesting one is Loki, which is this uh, volcanic feature here, um, which actually doesn't seem to have changed very much, John says, in 20 odd years. Uh, but a very interesting moon, and you certainly wouldn't want to live on Io. It's a very unpleasant place, bathed in Jupiter's radiation fields, um, all sorts of volcanic activity going on. So back to the sky. Um, this is the sky about midnight. So you've got, when in the winter, you've got Capella high up. Um, you've got Ursa Major uh, near the zenith, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and you have the sort of stars of the springtime coming up in the east, so Boötes and Virgo. And of course, Virgo is where all the galaxies are. So we're in that transitional time of the year at the moment where we're going from the kind of really bright stars of the winter constellations, Orion, Rhinoceros, Gemini, Taurus, and we're exchanging them for the rather less showy stars of the, the spring sky, so Leo, Cancer, Virgo. Uh, but that's, that's where all the galaxies are. This is where all the showy kind of deep sky stuff is. Early in the morning, though, if you get up, um, it doesn't need to be that late. I mean, if you get up 7, 7.30 and go out, you'll see a very, very bright object, very low down in the southeast, and that's Venus. And what's remarkable, although it happens every time Venus goes around the sun, is just how quickly Venus has gone uh, from being quite high up in the morning sky to being very low down. And that's because of the geometry. It's essentially moving away from us, moving across, uh, moving towards superior conjunction, but it doesn't get there for a long time. But it's also moved a long way south in the sky. And so Venus is very low down, uh, but it's still a very, very prominent object. And it has been for the last few mornings when it's been very transparent, very clear in the morning. Uh, that very bright star-like thing in the southeast is Venus. And here are some drawings. <laughs> I I, I, I'm, sure you, I'm sure you could probably size me. So here are some drawings by Paul of Venus. And the reason I put them this way up is that all of the images I've got are not that. So just so. I could do that. I could do that. Um, so again, some, some features on Venus. This one I rather like. Though this is um, just shows how incredibly bright Venus is. This is uh, Mazin Yunus's picture that he posted on the BAA webpage. Um, from just at the end of last year, December the 31st, showing Venus rising above a local ridge where his uh, telescope is in Morocco. So he has a remote telescope in Morocco, um, which if you read, there was an article in the journal a few journals ago about how he set that up and, and uh, the people who've helped him with it. So a really interesting story, but producing some really nice results as well. But because Venus is so low down now, pretty much lost it from an imaging point of view from the northern hemisphere. Um, so this is, these are Clyde Foster images, and we had Clyde on uh, at our meeting, uh, again, a few meetings ago, from Namibia, where Venus is high up in the sky, imaging it. It's now gibbous phase, getting quite small as it moves away from the Earth. But uh, detail here visible both in the, um, the left-hand images, which are infrared, I think, and the right-hand images, which are UV. Just before Christmas, I mentioned this. This was an occultation of Betelgeuse by an asteroid, um, asteroid Leona. And I suggested that various people might uh, try and observe with this with remote telescopes. Um, Alex Pratt uh, actually went down, did the much better thing, and went down to a golf resort in Spain with some equipment to actually observe it and uh, got this rather nice light curve. But what's more impressive, I think, is this. And I'm not sure how well this will come out on the screen. This is a video he shot. Yeah, this is a video he shot of Orion. So there's the belt stars, there's Rigel, there's uh, Betelgeuse. And if you watch it, um, Betelgeuse will disappear for a while. 
So that must have been a pretty cool thing to see with the naked eye, um, to see a, a star disappear um, because an asteroid went in front of it. And what's interesting, and the reason for the shape of this light curve being a kind of a U-shape like this, is this was a, essentially an annular eclipse of Betelgeuse. The apparent diameter of the asteroid was about the same or a little bit smaller than the apparent diameter of Betelgeuse. So essentially at the middle of this eclipse, you could still see Betelgeuse shining around the outside of the asteroid, which is uh, pretty amazing. Right, on to comets. So there's three interesting comets around at the moment. Well, there's a lot more than that, but probably three, three interesting comets um, that I want to talk about. This one is Comet 62P, Shushin Shan. Um, it's uh, bright, the brightest comet around at the moment. It's, it's best seen in the morning sky. And this Mazen Yunus picture from Morocco shows that it actually has quite a nice ion tail. So, whoops. Here we go. This is the ion tail there in a, in a pushed image. Um, but it's a kind of typical big extended coma comet. Um, the magnitude is a bit misleading in that, like with all comets, because the, the light is spread out over a large area. It's a very, very difficult thing to see visually. Um, but it's, it's a nice imaging target. Uh, oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I, uh, the trouble is, I'm no, I don't actually know where these things are. I just tell the telescope to go and point them. But it, it, it is a, it's, a, it's best seen in the morning sky. Is it Virgo? Oh, it is Virgo, because in fact, and in fact, I'll show you a picture in a minute taken by uh, somebody showing it in front of um, some Virgo cluster of galaxies. So there you go. So deep sky person knows more about where a comet is than the comet sets from Virgo. Um, the other comets that are interesting are interesting because they outburst regularly. So this one is a comet 12, uh, 29P Schwarzman-Bachmann, which we've been observing for a long time. It's in a almost circular orbit um, outside the orbit of Jupiter. And it uh, outbursts quite regularly. And Richard Miles runs a project for the BAA called Mission 29P, which compiles all the observations together. And he's formulating a theory as to why these outbursts happen. There, there, are, there are theories in the professional comet world, but they really don't explain how these outbursts can happen in such a regular way and be uh, essentially predictable in the way that they are and can lead to the effects that we see. And so we've got 29P, which we've been studying for quite a few years, uh, which has actually just recently gone into outburst, just a few days ago. So this is a, a picture um, taken by Dave Storey in the Isle of Man from the Glyn Marsh Observatory in the Isle of Man. And Dennis Brzezinski detected it going into outburst. So this is a light curve that uh, um, Richard maintains. And you can see here um, it's just gone into outburst, so it's, it's kind of jumped up by a couple of magnitudes. Um, it goes into outburst and then it fades away again. And until recently, 12P was, was fairly unique in the way that it behaved, but we have a comet coming back now, which is 12P Pons Brooks, which we know from past returns, because this is a comet with a period of just over 70 years. We know when it last came back, it had outbursts. And we've been lucky enough to be able to see these outbursts ourselves this time back. So this is the, the big outburst that occurred back in November, on November the 14th. So what you have here is you have the comet nucleus. Effectively, all of a sudden, ejects a large amount of material. So gas, and the gas takes out with it dust. And what we're seeing here is the expansion of two spherical coma. The central bright one is the dust. And the fainter one is gas. And in images, you can see the fainter one is a kind of greenish color. The central one is white. So what we're seeing here is, is dust that's been ejected from the comet by the, the, the gas um, in, a, in a very, very sudden event. So this isn't over a period of hours. This is over a period of minutes, because we've detected these 
outbursts occurring, and we can see how rapidly the, the comet brightness changes. The, the ejection velocity for this comet, 12p, um, is of the order of three or 400 meters per second for the, for the dust material. So this was back in November. The comet has been fairly quiet for a while, actually, but it's been going through Cygnus, and so it's passed some really nice deep sky objects. So this is another Mas and Eunice image of the comet sailing past the Crescent Nebula in Cygnus. And Paul, again, our indefatigable visual observer, has been observing it. It's really interesting, actually, because to those of us who are imaging this comet, it's quite a bright object. It's a really ob easy object to image. But as a visual observer, it's much more difficult because essentially the light is spread out over a large, large area. So Paul's been doing a really good job, and he actually um, sent me a message uh, when he made this observation saying that he wasn't entirely sure uh, that it was the comet, but it definitely is. It's in the right place. But it so happens that this was one day before the comet went into outburst again. And unfortunately, on the day it went into outburst, Paul, you didn't get home early enough to be able to observe it. It was treed out, because it is quite low down now in Cygnus in the evening sky. So this is the light curve that we're maintaining for this comet so far, and it's, it's a fascinating light curve. So what you can see here, we're looking at not the total magnitude of the comet, which doesn't vary by a huge amount, but we're looking at the magnitude of the very central part of the comet in, in a very small photometric aperture. And what we can see here is these um, sudden changes and in fact, on these plots, so this is where we caught it actually in the, in the process of outbursting. You can see there, there are three outbursts that took place, the November one, one in uh, late November, and then one in um, mid-December. And they're all about 15 days apart. So you can see there's a kind of period there. Um, but it turns out that we didn't have an outburst at the predicted 15 days after, after that third one. It's about 35 days. But this is the outburst that we've just had. Um, just a, a day or two ago, again, Denis Brzezinski uh, detected that with John Francois Soulier in France, who detected it at the same time. About as soon as it got dark um, on, on the night of the 18th. Um, so we've got some images of that. This is uh, Dennis's image showing it very early in the outburst with the kind of bright core and then expanding. And then I've got a slide that I've got in completely the wrong order. <laughs> so you'll just have to forgive me, but I, I don't know why this got in the wrong place. This is 62P again, but uh, by Peter Tickner. So this is the comet that's got the, the nice ion tail, and it's the one that's crossing Virgo. So you've got some nice Virgo galaxies. So a brief interlude going on that comet, and then back uh, to uh, 12p. So this is 12p expansion over, over one night. So uh, the image on the left there was taken um, on the 18th, just about, we think, about 10 hours after the outburst. The image on the right was taken on the 19th, about 34 hours after the outburst. And you can see the sort of familiar structure here in that... Um, you get brighter rays and you get a darker rift. Um, and Richard explains that by the geometry of the way that the outburst happens and how the outflow from the outburst is blocked by the nucleus itself right at the time of the outburst. And then that explains uh, a lot of what we actually see in the expanding coma. In terms of the total magnitude of the comet, it's all over the place. Uh, variable star observers would hate this. This is basically um, tracking the, um, the peak brightness. So you've got all these outbursts. Um, but it's predicting a brightness of somewhere around 4 at perihelion, possibly a little bit brighter than that. And the, and the reason that's quite interesting to me is that the total eclipse of April the 8th potentially gives us an opportunity to observe that comet because it will be in the sky about 20 degrees from the sun not far from Jupiter in the sky during that total eclipse. Now, depending on how bright the comet is, and it's probably not going to be much brighter than four, maybe three, and it's quite an extended object, it might be potentially visible in binoculars during the eclipse, and you've got four minutes to have a look for it. But it certainly should be something you can pick up on photographs. 
So maybe as an opportunity to take a picture of a comet in an eclipse if, you're, if you happen to be out there. Right at the other end of the scale, just to show you that we look at comets of all magnitudes, this is a comet that's currently not yet confirmed a comet. It's on a thing called the Possible Comets Confirmation page. Uh, but Peter Bertwistle and I imaged this the other night. And I think you can see there's a kind of little tail here. So these comets are put on that page when they don't know whether they're actually comets or not. And I think this probably confirms that it does. But this is a, a comet that's magnitude 18 and a half. Um, so not the kind of thing that many people will bother with. So, leaving comets behind and going for variables now. This variable, this uh, supernova in M101, has been there for an awfully long time. It's still there. M101 is now a, a morning object for us. Uh, but the BAA light curve is really phenomenal for that. It's really well-sampled light curve. And you can see a really interesting profile. So it's, it's an object that's still there, still, still worth following, um, in a nice galaxy. Uh, but it does involve you getting up in the morning. We've had another nice supernova recently in, a, in another nice galaxy. So this one in NGC 4216, um, which I think is in Virgo again, isn't it, Nick? Um, that's where most galaxies are. But this is SN 2024 GY. So this picture by Norman Gray shows it nicely. And then we've got another picture here by David Strange in colour showing it too. Uh, we have an old nova which has been around again for a long time, but is still reasonably bright. This is the Nova in Cassiopeia, Nova Cass 2021, B1405 Cass. Uh, and this picture here by Mazen Yunus shows that it's in a really nice part of the sky. So you've got the bubble nebula here. And that Nova is still around and is still actually reasonably bright. So it's, it's still about 12th magnitude or so. So it's a, a Nova that looks like it's going to be with us for a, a very long time. If you're into um, looking for outbursts of variable stars, though, you do need to get up in the morning because the most interesting one, and this is the one that Jeremy has mentioned several times and I've mentioned several times, is in uh, Corona Borealis here. It's uh, T Corona Borealis. So this is the star which we think is going to go into an outburst sometime this year, sometime, do we have a better prediction, sometime kind of April time, is that? Right, so there you go. So, but it's a, it's a star that's definitely worth observing. So, luckily, this, this is an image uh, from Mike Harlow that was put up on the website uh, from this morning, um, I think. Are we the 20th of January today? Yep. 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 So, from this morning. So, that's, that's uh, kind of right bang up to date, showing T Corona Borealis there, and the light curve here showing these various um, oscillations um, that are, are there, but then there's also a general fading, which is a precursor to, uh, to this outburst happening. So definitely worth keeping an eye on that. Then in terms of other things on the um, observers uh, forum on the website, I did chuckle over this one. Anyone, anyone who's struggled, anyone who's struggled with accessing a website by, you know, click on all the squares that have a bus in them or something. Um, so this, this I thought from Steve was really good. This is uh, click on all the squares that have got a quasar in them. <laughs> is that right? Is that right, Matthew? There's always three. Right, okay. But you know because you put it together. But I, I find these things really irritating. But anyway, this, this, uh, this is quite good and made me chuckle and it actually encouraged um, Robin Ledbetter to go out and actually do some spectroscopy of these things. And again, amazing that amateur spectroscopy is so good now. You know, you can pick up redshifts of objects. So these, these are really interesting spectra where spectral lines which would normally be far in the UV and not detectable by amateurs on the Earth's surface have been redshifted far enough that we can detect them. So just one final thing before I finish. Coming up to the end of this, you'll be pleased to hear, is this. So the moon I mentioned earlier is being a good occulting disk in a, an interesting place, but it's a, it's a place where lots of people have been sending spacecraft recently, but it seems to be eating or killing most of the spacecraft that go there. So there was a Japanese lander that landed, I think, yesterday, which has suffered a power failure. But this is Peregrine, which is one of the first 
what is the first commercial lander that America has sent to the moon. Um, it was launched on the new Vulcan Centaur rocket. So this is the rocket that replaces the, the good old Atlas Centaur with um, a Vulcan stage, which is actually, the, the propellants in this are the same as, uh, as what Elon Musk nine, uses in the eight, um, seven, Starship six, uh, launch. It's five, methane, four, liquid methane and liquid three. oxygen. We have so you can see the flame is quite blue, because basically it's burning natural gas. Um, so this rocket launched um, Peregrine, launch top stage is the uh, Centaur, and it's the Centaur that pushes Peregrine off towards its long looping orbit to the moon. But we were very lucky in that it was launched in such a way that we had a really good view of it from here um, in the night sky throughout the night as it moved gradually towards the moon. So here it is, this is the lander um, taken on the 9th of January by Grant Privet, and then Nick Quinn took another image of it here. So in, in, in Grant's image, the stars are fixed, but you can see the lander moving with respect to the stars. In Nick's one, the stars have been trailed so that you can see the lander because it's much fainter here. So this is when the lander was at Apogee, which was basically the distance of the moon. Um, I got an image of it there as well, so here it is. Um, and, and the reason we could do that is that the, the orbit basically was fired into an orbit, a very long elliptical orbit that went up to the altitude of the moon, but the moon wasn't there on the first time it went by. So the idea was that it would actually be captured by the moon on the second time around. But unfortunately, the lander had a propellant leak, which meant that it couldn't actually land on the moon. So what they decided to do was just let it go all the way around, come back again, and re-enter the Earth's atmosphere after uh, a 10-day or so trip to the moon and back, um, which it did a couple of days ago over the Pacific. And this is my last view of it, was in the morning of the day that it actually re-entered. So this is the morning of the 18th, I think. What was interesting, and I didn't realize at the time when I took this picture of the uh, lander, was that at exactly the time I put, took the picture of this lander, the lander was taking a picture of me. So this was taken at the time I was imaging the lander. In the morning, coming up to morning twilight, so you know, we're, we're near that morning terminator. So that's kind of two, two ways. It was taking a picture of me, and I was taking a picture of it. So that's, that's quite good. The Centaur stage um, just got pushed out into heliocentric orbit. And part of the problem with that is that nobody tracks it. Once it's been pushed out into heliocentric orbit, it's been disposed of, nobody tracks it. But amateurs can do astrometry of this. So we can predict what's going to happen to the Centaur stage. And in fact, it's going to come back to the Earth in 2037. So whatever asteroid surveys there are out there will discover some mysterious thing in a heliocentric orbit in 2037, uh, which if hopefully, if they've got access to the data we created, they'll know is actually the centaur from this launch and not some little green men who are coming in to invade the Earth. So it's been a really interesting time the last few weeks since the Christmas meeting. Try and have a look. I mean, there's all sorts of things in the sky to look at. Um, 12P is a really interesting comet. Uh, it's going to get brighter over the next uh, few months as it comes towards perihelion. Try and have a look at that. Look at Jupiter whilst, uh, whilst you've got the chance. If you get home tonight, have a look at the moons around Jupiter. Um, generally, lots of things in the sky. Of course, it's, it's, as we go into the spring now, we're, we're moving into the spring constellations. The nights are getting shorter and shorter. And before you know it, we'll be in the summer and uh, there won't be any nights at all. So thank you very much. And just one final thing. Some of us go off after this meeting to the parcel yard in King's Cross Station. So that's the pub at the end of the platform, in King, uh, right beyond all the platforms, beyond platform eight and three quarter or whatever where Harry Potter lives in, uh, in King's Cross for a drink. And anybody, if you would like to join us, there's always lots of interesting things we talk about. So please come along and uh, have a drink. And it's up the stairs. It is up the stairs. Yes, that's right. So as you go past Harry Potter on the right, you go up the stairs, and we're, we're usually somewhere in there. But come, come and find us. <laughs> that's right. OK, thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Thank you. We've run out of time now. Uh, we've got to exit now quite quickly because uh, the technician and uh, so on want to go home. So thank you very much, all very much, and I hope to see many of them you at the March meeting.